pieces of the same puzzle. We come together in God's name, and as we work together toward the same goal, each piece of the puzzle begins to fit neatly into place, creating a breathtaking picture of love, compassion, courage, and grace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you do have the agenda before you. If I could have um, someone move that we pass the agenda. I'll move. It's Maria. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. And can we have a seconder? I can second it. It's Brenda. Thanks, Brenda. Um, let's consider the agenda as approved and we can move on to our action items. So action item 2.1 is the election of chair. I'm just going to read my script here. Um, so we will now proceed with the election of the chair and vice chair of SIAC for the period of January 2021 to December of 2021. Should a vote by secret ballot become necessary this evening, Jody O'Reilly, our spec ed coordinator, will act as scrutineer while I tabulate the ballots. We will follow the board bylaws. Members will cast his or her vote by means of a private telephone conversation or by email with the scrutineer who shall make the vote on a paper ballot in the same form and manner as though the ballots had been marked in person by the voter and the ballots shall be counted. The ballots cast electronically in this matter are subject to the same obligations of confidentiality on the part of the scrutineer as those cast by voters physically at the meeting. With that said, I'm going to move it along. Um, we are going to start with the call for nominations for chair of the Special Education Advisory Committee for the term of January 2021 to December 2021. We will now proceed with the election of the chair of SEAC for the term of January 2021 to December 2021. I'm officially calling for nominations for the chair of SEAC for the term of January 2021 to December 2021. Do we have any nominations? I would I like to make a nomination. Oh, sorry. Um, Nancy? Was, I, I thought I heard somebody else. They can. Can you? Um... Hi, hi, Nancy. Sorry, it's it's Rick. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna just uh, nominate Brenda Agnew for chair. Sorry to I'll interrupt. Second, I'll second it then. Okay, great. Okay. 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 Good thought. Great. So, thank you. We have a nominee, um, and we have a seconder. I'd ask the nominated person if they accept the nomination. Brenda, do you accept the nomination? Um, yeah, happy to accept it. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for the chair of SEAC for the term of January 21 to December 21? I'd like to make a final call for nominations. Is there an, any other nomination? Hearing no other nominations, it does affirm that Brenda Agnew will be the chair of SEAC for the term of January 2021 to December 2021. Congratulations, Brenda. Is there anything that you'd like to say? Um, thank you. I um, no, I, I get you. Know, thank you, everybody. Uh, I obviously I love this um, committee, and and I'm honored to be the chair and, and I'm happy to do the work and work with you. So uh, I, I'm so thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to chair again and I look forward to a great year ahead. Thank you, Brenda. OK, so we'll move on to item 2.2. We will call for nomination for vice chair. We'll now proceed with the election of the vice chair of SEAC for January 2021 to December 2021. I'm officially calling for nominations for the vice chair of SEAC for that. Uh, yes, I'd like to, it's Deborah from Autism Ontario. Yes. Uh, I'd like to nominate Maria um, from uh, um, ABC Ontario. I'm sorry, the, your last name, Maria Lorenko. I think I said it right, um, but that I would like to nominate her for vice chair, please. Thank you, Deborah. Is there a seconder? If Do I second like, my own nomination? 
Pardon me? Sorry, can I second my own nomination? <clears throat> um, yeah, I second the nomination. He's Dan. Dan is seconding, is the seconder on that nomination. So Maria has been nominated. Dan is the seconder. Um, Maria, you've been nominated. Do you accept the nomination? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Are there any other nominations for the vice chair of SEAC? So I'm going to make a final call for nominations. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Hearing no other nominations, it does affirm that Maria Lorenko will be the vice chair of SEAC. Congratulations, Maria. Would you like to say anything? Um, just that I'm, I'm honored and thank you. And I look forward to um, working with Brenda and, and everyone else. Um, I really enjoy this role as well. So looking forward to the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you to the group. Um, we did not have to go to our, our ballot and our secret ballot, so we can leave that piece at this time. And I will now pass it over to Brenda to move on to item 2.3. Okay, thanks. I just need one. I just need a second. <clears throat> Sorry, it's my husband's fiftieth birthday today, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still in in planning mode. Um, okay, so uh, item two point three is the approval of the minutes. Um, has everyone had a chance to take a look at the uh, minutes from the last meeting? Was there any um, additions, deletions, questions, comments at all on the minutes? No? Okay, can I get a mover? Uh, Nancy, move, thank you. Do I have a seconder for the minutes? Uh, seconded by Rick, thanks so much, Rick. Okay, so uh, that's great. So moving on to um, item number three, uh, we've got a couple of presentations tonight. Um, we had the honor of um, seeing the first presentation at our last board meeting, and I asked if the if the group would come and present to SEAC um, because I was just really, really impressed um, with the presentation and the subject matter. So I welcome Andrea and Rob. I don't know if you're both here, um, but to present to the group on the new updated website. Thanks, Brenda. And I know I'm on here. I haven't, I'm assuming Rob is here. He was coming on, so hopefully he is. Yeah, I'm here. To, oh, he's here. Very good. I need to tell everybody because everybody who will listen, I, I mentioned this too. Rob's wife is about to have a baby. So right. we've been, yes, and we're very excited, but we're also very stressed <laughs> because we've had to hit all these different milestones. And um, so I'm very happy to tell you that I'm not doing this solo tonight. You'll get the full report with Rob, which is, uh, it's, it's a good thing for you because he's he's much better at presenting this than I am. So let me begin by, first of all, quickly uh, congratulating Brenda and Maria um, on being acclaimed uh, chair and vice chair of SEAC, respectively. And I've never been to SEAC to witness an election that's much smoother than, I, than I'm used to. So congratulations, both of you. So Rob is sharing his screen, and I'm going to quickly introduce um what we what we talked about so i'm we're, we're going to try not to take up too much of your time i know you have a really heavy agenda tonight and uh, we just want to kind of give you an overview um, of the new website as most of you will have noticed we recently launched the new website and in large part to address current accessibility uh, requirements, but also in because of our ongoing efforts to meet our commitment to ensure that communication is clear and transparent and responsive so as of January 2021, in accordance with the Accessibility of Ontarians with Disabilities Act, known as AODA, all public sector organizations must ensure their websites meet web content accessibility guidelines, that's WCAG 2.0 level AA compliance standards. What this means, WCAG 2.0 is an international accepted standard for web accessibility developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. It covers a wide range of recommendations for making web content 
uh, more accessible and following the guidelines will make the content accessible to a wider range of people with disabilities, including blindness and low vision, deafness and hearing loss, learning disabilities, cognitive limitations, limited movement, speech disabilities, both photosensitivity and any combinations thereof. So the guidelines are organized under four principles of accessibility which I'm not going to get into, they're in a report, but they, I'll just name them perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And for each guideline, there are a list of success criteria, which are at three levels, so A, AA, and AAA. And obviously, at each level, it's progressively becomes progressively more stringent in terms of what is required, but also at each level, it becomes much easier for persons with disabilities to use a website, which is what we want. So as of January 2021, all public sector websites and content posted after 2012 must meet level AA. This applies to all public facing websites, including school and board websites. But just so you know, the, web, the requirement does not apply currently to internal intranet websites. OK, so in 2016, we began overhauling our our school websites and all of our last year we did our secondaries all of our websites including our Thomas Merton website are, are now fully accessible they meet the accessibility needs however our board website as most of you know had a number of accessibility concerns which we have addressed it's certainly a work in progress and um, over the next few months we will continue to make adjustments and some of which Rob will address in a minute um, but so far that the response has been great and we have, you know, up until today, we're still making tweaks to it based on feedback that we've received. So we certainly welcome your feedback, whether you share it collectively as a SEAC or if you want to share it individually with us, please feel free to email, email I'm sorry, email myself or Rob. Um, and at this time, I think I'm going to turn it over to Rob so he can start taking you through the tour. Thanks, Andrea. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, and uh, as Andrea said, I won't take up too much of your time, but we are really excited to share the website um, because of the, the new features. Uh, a lot went into this in, in terms of um, planning and uh, making a more logical flow of content. Um, but for the purpose of this meeting, I'll be focusing mostly on how we we've, we've managed to meet those and, and exceed those accessibility uh, requirements. I believe actually we meet many of the 3.0 requirements, not just 2.0, uh, which is exciting. So we'll continue obviously uh, to move forward with the website uh, and ensure that it is accessible for all. So one of the main features of the new website, in contrast to the old site, uh, that does make a site more accessible is what's called um, responsive. A responsive website will adjust based on the device you're viewing it on. Uh, many of you I'm sure have experience with this when looking online at other websites where the site looks great um, on desktop but also on mobile and I can share with you how that responds here on our site. So by resizing my, my browser window um, I can mimic what it might look like on an iPhone. So that sort of vertical view. So right away that you probably noticed that um, the menu disappears, as does the video. So the video uh, disappearing is is not doesn't mean accessibility, but it is. Um, it's it's mostly because on mobile devices people can be on um, their wireless network, and video does take a, a lot of bandwidth. So we're saving people's bandwidth. Uh, and data limits by removing the video and replacing it with a still image. Um, the menu you'll see becomes this flyout menu. This it's called off canvas, um, make, meaning that it's 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 hidden. But with the click of a button or the top of a finger, you're displaying the menu. And from there, <clears throat> with the top of of a finger on each um, uh, parent level menu item, so parent parents, students, schools, etc. It will expand displaying all um, all pages, uh, sub pages of, of that main parent page. Um, previously, uh, you may have noticed on the board site um, it, it was not responsive. So clicking on a particular link and then locating a sub page uh, was extremely difficult to do because you'd have to zoom in. That can be very troublesome and just pinpoint accuracy trying to get a menu link. This is all based on um, 
you know, the size of a finger and gesture, um, and also um, any text-to-speech and voice command as well, which is built into uh, smart devices. Um, so let me show you. So with a click of a button, we can get to any page and then back to the menu. At any point, if somebody's scrolling down the website, you see that the menu does stay present. So at any point, you don't have to scroll back up. You just click the menu, open it up, and you can get to the next page that you're looking for. Another thing that you'll notice is how content reflows. So on a large display, a laptop display, for example, a desktop display, even um, an iPad, you'll get, um, or a larger iPad, I should say, that the 12 the 12 inch iPads, you'll see that you get a full screen view of, of you know everything that you're looking for, whether it's menu or content. Um, and then and what happens on smaller smaller devices is that content will actually reflow. Um, so it'll resize, you see a little snap there of resizing, and then eventually it starts to reflow into a two column versus four, and then single column. So it becomes easy to read. Text is easy to read, and um, it's obviously easy to scroll and then click on what you're looking for. So that that is one huge uh, part of what meets accessibility, so responsive design. Um, above and beyond, though, there's actually quite a lot here that makes the site accessible. Um, so one uh, one is is that uh, previously on on the website and uh, on non-compliant websites, text within an image cannot be read by someone uh, who uses a device like text-to-speech um, because text-to-speech does not understand uh, pixels and translate those into words. So by having live text, what's called live text, uh, that is any text that you can like highlight uh, or translate, um, you're, you're meeting that, that uh, accessibility requirement because those, those other devices can read that text left to right. It can highlight what a link is, uh, versus um, text within an image. So that that's a, a major consideration that went into the website. So at wherever possible, and that is probably almost everywhere, um, you'll see that there is very little text unless it is maybe part of an image, but you'll see that in that case, um, the text is also made available in, in live text underneath. In, in this example of um, of news. If we go back to the main site, you'll see the same thing. So previously, let's say an icon maybe had, you know, school year calendar or you know staff access. It was it was an actual graphic. Here we have live text with with the icon. Um, so uh, any and the the other the other um, piece to that is that where where images do appear, there's something called alternative text. And so all of our image has alternative text meaning that someone who uh, has vision impairment and does use text-to-speech, um, as that text-to-speech device scrolls through our website, it actually says what the image is based on the alt text that we've included. So in the example of something like this D2L, it would say D2L logo or Office 365 logo, Google logo, et cetera. Um, so again, so th those that are, are used to browsing sites, um, They'll they'll get a sense of where everything is on the site, um, regardless of of any disability. Um, I will also mention we've added an additional layer of of accessibility on top of the website, which which is compliant, that goes above and beyond. And this is um, uh, this allows for even more control over things like contrast, so high contrast or low contrast, black and white those types of things. So this little accessibility icon in the corner um, is added onto the website, almost like a top layer, um, and it is active on every single page. So if I if I click on it, you'll see that there's a ton of features that can be turned on and off based on the user. So uh, seizure profile, uh, ADHD profile, um, there's uh, keyboard navigation, so it would display you know, uh, left, right buttons, et cetera, for if, if there's something that you need to use a keyboard for to display more information or tab. Um, you can magnify text. So we can, you know, increase the size of text or highlight links. You'll see here with a click of a button, anything that is a link has a highlight around it. Uh, just again, above and beyond sort of the, the, the 2.0 accessibility, uh, but we felt it was important. 
I leave anything on here? I don't think I did. And Rob, maybe you should mention that the idea for this accessibility widget, even though I know it's not a widget, it's a it's a it's an overlay. Apparently, mm -hmm. uh, it did come from Brenda. She actually found this on another website, and um, it was part of her wish list. And we thought it was pretty neat. So um, we did we didn't need it to to comply with the 2.0, but we thought it would be a great add on. Absolutely. Yes, and that's where that's where feedback um, in consultation with this committee really helps us and drives, you know, what we, you know, meeting requirements is one thing, but you know, the voice of the committee um, certainly we're we're all ears. So if we can implement it, uh, it's something that is compatible with our website. Then um, of course we look into it. So this was a you know a great suggestion, Brenda. So thank you for that. Um, Another, I just also wanted to mention too, on um, in terms of navigating uh, and finding information, um, everything that that would be accessible on desktop is also on the um, on mobile, and we've wanted we really want to make sure that um, information is accessible to our parents and our students and staff. Uh, so you know, without having to dig down into you know several layers. As we found was happening on the old site, we've tried to streamline our our menu system and navigation. We've tried to make things uh, more accessible in terms of finding news and information. So with the click of a button, we can actually scroll through months of information, uh, or sorry, months months of news that's been posted to the website. Um, here's another example. So it, you'll see that it just loads very quickly. So um, it's all on all on display and everything. Um, Anything that's that's new is automatically pulled into the into the, the website. So we we have ultimate control over what, what the page looks like. If we need to add or remove a section or uh, modify a section, we have that. It's all done in house, and we have all access to um, to to those modifications, including the menu system, which I've touched on. Um, I'll I'll I'll, I, I'll close with just sort of the 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 addition of the search capability that we've added. So standard search capability in most uh, sites uh, is powered by the site itself. Um, there's limitations to that. So we've actually um, we're actually using a Google um, Google Admin Console to power our search for the website. Um, the benefit to that is it actually doesn't just pull up based on date, but on relevance using um, Google um, Google's powerful search engine. So if I were to a search for example special education it would find every page including pdfs on our on our website that mention mention special education so this this string so if i hit search you'll see that it populates 3300 results um, and that is in order sorted by relevance by default so anything that that re that mentions um special education or whatever term we search uh, comes up very quickly. So again, another useful tool. I think that was a limitation on the old site that it didn't always populate all the results or or certainly it, it wasn't populating them in the order that maybe we would have liked them to. So simply clicking on it gets you to the page that you're looking for. And for example, if you're looking for um, a special education committee, you can find that under parents very quickly. It gives you um, YouTube link embedded right in the site, which we did not have previously. You can also find that under uh, board level committees, which includes all board board level committees, a short description of each, and a learn more button. Again, all mobile friendly, so you're not, uh, you know, pin. You don't need pinpoint accuracy. You can actually use the button, which is more the size of a uh, of a finger. So, anyway, I think that uh, that's a very very quick overview. A lot, a lot more went into it, and and uh, we did go over a lot of those details in the board at the board meeting. Um, Andrea, if there's anything else that you wanted to touch on, please let me know, or feel free to uh, to take over. I think you covered it, Rob. I know they they have a lot on their agenda. Unless there are any questions, Brenda, we we'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks uh, so much. Is there any questions um, at all? Uh, yeah, Maria, go ahead. So I had um, a comment, a question, and a suggestion. So <clears throat> um, similar to what I shared at CPIC, but it's a different group here. So first of all, I think the website's great, <clears throat> very sleek and modern, and I love that it's um, images of our own um, students and families, not just stock images. Um, I was wondering um, if you would consider having um, a tab along the top for special education 
Um, I, I believe special education is under learning and resources, but I don't think, and I looked at it quickly, but I don't think there's anything about SEAC under there. I know that it's under board level committees and sort of the same comment again. If you know what SEAC is, you know, you, you would know to look there, I suppose. But if we're trying to increase awareness, I, I don't know that um, it's easy to find. I didn't realize it was under parents, but I think, you know, something special education along the top would incorporate the learning and resource information and SEAC and, and, and might um, attract more attention. And I know we have the PAC on SEAC survey coming up later. And that's one of the things they talk about is increasing awareness of SEAC through board websites and making it easy to find and so on. So that would be my, um, that would be a suggestion I'd like to put forward. And if anyone else would like to chime in on that, that would be great. And just my question, um, there used to be several years of board agendas and SEAC agendas and minutes available. And now I can only go back a few months. And so I'm not sure if there's somewhere else or what's happening there. Cause you know, I don't always, I find even if I'm looking for some SEAC minutes, it's usually easier to just go to the board website than to dig through my emails or, or, or whatnot. So yeah. no, that's, that's all I have, question. sorry. No, no, and thank you, Maria. That's, um, that's a great question. So in terms of the, the navigation what you see up on top there we've really we've limited what's up on top of the navigation to make it easier for for to make it more intuitive for users of our website and also easier for for uh, anybody visiting to find information they need um, so we've structured it in a way based on and and again we we did when we went back to when we were looking at developing the frame before we even began, before Rob began to, uh, designing the new website, we looked at the Google, the website analytics, um, and we also looked at the survey results for what people are, are looking for when they come to our website. So we kind of based uh, that, we looked at, we based the navigation, both navigation and Rob, if you want to go to the, to the landing page as well, um, the icons. So in, more in terms of real estate those icons that you see underneath the the rolling video find a school mental health and well-being school your calendar transportation meetings and staff access that's even more real estate to be better real estate to be honest with you because if you look at it from a mobile um and again rob if you want to collapse it so they can see um as rob showed you earlier you see that you lose the navigation you get the little lines there which is obviously still fully accessible, but you do lose the navigation, but you do see the icons. Um, so, but those icons there, and we don't plan to leave it static. We plan to um, keep checking our analytics, see what's, what is being uh, looked at, what is being visited, what pages are frequently being visited, and we can adjust those icons accordingly. We know that a lot of the, our visitors are coming on here because they want to find a school. Right now, mental health and well-being is one of our adjustments that we made a couple of weeks ago. That's hot right now. People want quickly, they want to find information, so we put it as an icon. Um, school Your Counter is always ongoing. Transportation, meetings, and staff access. But, I mean, I'm not saying we're certainly open, uh, Maria, to to looking at, we want to help uh, you profile special education and SEAC as much as possible. That's why we did, you, it's, you're not losing your mind. It wasn't under parents previously. We put it under parents uh, because we put uh, Catholic Parent Involvement Committee. So we felt it was only fair to also include special education committee under there as well. Um, so we can, we're certainly willing to work with you to, to help. And I might stick around to hear what the results of that survey are, but um, in terms of the navigation up on top, that's not right now. That's not something it's very tight in terms of what we can put up there as soon as with that logo right there. So I think Rob is looking at it from the perspective of a desktop. If you're looking at it from an iPad that comes butting up against um, parents right now. So we can't even add, you know, a seventh uh, uh, section under the navigation bar logistically we'd have to remove one and I just don't know which one we could remove to be honest but um, yeah I do think the icons are better but again we like to use um, we like to base our decisions on on you know 
research. And so that's why we, we look at what what's being visited, but maybe we can test it. Maybe we can uh, play around with it and uh, see which one we can lose. Maybe right now people aren't checking out the school year calendar quite as much and we can rotate it. Uh, Andrea, so I'm open, go ahead, Rob. If I could add to that too, and you know, it is a valid point. We understand you know, the importance of uh, menu systems, um, but the site is, is, is more more than a menu system and you know there is a network of sites at play here so that's you know between our school site um, our board site and the real estate that we have available on this board site there's a lot we can do um, not just post something in a menu um, but certainly the real estate that we have andrea's touched on these icons being something that we hope to rotate um, whether it's news and information under what's happening in, uh, across. This is very valuable real estate yeah. um, that we can take advantage of, whether it's you know a story that highlights something that's happening, whether it's at the school level or at the at the board level. Um, certainly, you know, rest assured, like it is it is uh, top of mind for us to make sure that you know all committees and you know, whether it's kindergarten re registration, whether it's special education or French programs, uh, you name it. I mean, we we want to give everyone the priority that they deserve, and you know, it's all very important to us. So, um, it, it's something that you have to understand as sort of on rotation that we can promote and we can highlight. the The website is sort of living, breathing. It's not it's not static. It's not ever meant to to stop um, being uh, updated. So, you know, if that if that can also tie into what Andrea is saying um, to the logistics of it. Uh, there, there's there is a lot here for us to do and there's a lot of flexibility in how we can promote. Yeah, and to what Rob is saying that I mean that website is just one tactic, one way that we can actually get information to to our parents, to our community. And it's not even it's very passive. I mean, if we could we could build on if you wanted to, we could build on a and, you know, we ha you have a communications committee, but we've talked about promoting SEAC and, and all the great things that your committee does and, and um, heightening awareness around special education. We can do that through we you know, we've got school websites, we can do feature stories, we can use social media, we can use there's so many things that we can do. Um, it's not just website, but I, I want to move on to your. I think you only had two questions, and the second one was around the meetings, and that was um, a very good observation, Maria. And uh, we we are working on. So the short answer is not all the meetings right now. A uh, meeting minutes, sorry, are are uh, posted on our website. It is what we're going to do is we're going back a year. And we'll go over this school year, I should say. So we're going to go back to the beginning of this school year. And, and Rob, did you go over the, the meetings? I don't know if you showed them that, no. the buckets. OK, yeah. so if you just show them SEAC, for instance. Um, sure. that, that's how the meetings are displayed now. So you'll see SEAC has its own um, color. You can actually see that it's in progress right now. You see that it's live. Um, right there, you post the agenda and we will be able to um, post the recording of your meeting and we will that's where we will post the minutes once they are approved so we're going to go back a year so back to so to this school year so to september 2020 and and um, backdate all this information and beyond that what we are doing is a repository of all the meetings so we have board meeting we have policy we have cpic we have CAC. we're going to have a repository so that you can anybody can go back and and essentially find a list of all the previous meetings and be able to click on find the, the minutes that they're looking for. So that's our solution uh, for the minutes. So in the meantime, I know it's frustrating if you're looking for for a particular. We do have access to the back end of our website. So if you if you are looking for any particular meeting, Maria, you can let me know and I can I can help you. In the interim. OK, that's great. So the, so it sounds like the repository is still a work in progress then. Yes, it's it's a huge and this is what I mean when I said it's still a work in progress. There's so many things policies we still need to, you know, and Rob didn't touch on that because we wanted to focus on the accessibility for your committee. But policies right now are still we posted them in PDF just because we needed to meet the, the January timeline. But the plan is get rid of PDFs and every single policy is going to be on its own page, um, the content of it. But in order to do that, it's changing workflow in the way we're used to, to running policy committee meetings and 
and um, and it's going to take some time. So that's probably we're thinking that's going to be done by the summer. So and the meetings as well. Ma the meetings might be sooner than that. Sorry, I just want to clarify. Did you say just the meeting minutes or the the full agenda packages as well will be in that repository? We could do both. We can do all. If you once we do, we pull one. We can pull all. Okay. Yeah, because it is useful sometimes. I've I've got. I mean, I don't know. Maybe not a lot of people do, but but I've gone back sometimes to better understand. Yeah, that, I have to. No, they are useful, yeah. and, and it's an archive. It'll essentially be like an archive. Okay, so I'll look forward to that. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you. the feedback, Maria. Yeah. I don't um, know if there's anything else. I just want to see. I think Dan. Uh, Dan, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, it wasn't uh, j just very quick. Uh, I guess um, uh, congratulations for uh, for the new site. Is I think the responsiveness is uh, way more um, uh, valuable than the, the accessibility here and uh, that that was a tremendous amount of work and it's really a different side right now um, I, uh, I just got one question on the tools for accessibility that uh, that you use to uh, to test and confirm the level of uh, the AA level. Do you want to take that, Rob? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, there is a list of criteria that uh, the Ontario government provides um, to meet the accessibility needs, um, but there are uh, tools available, third party tools that can run a quick diagnostics of, of your site. On the back end, we do have um, um, some tools that tell us um, it's it is. It, 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 it displays what's called readability, so that the ability for information to um, be accessible with on the, within the website. Um, so each page is ranked on a on a re readability scale. But overall, it all it's all based on the structure of a website that meets those those criteria. Um, so that that is really more of a framework. That's not something. Um, that, that's the sort of the basis of, of, of meeting AODA, but there are third party tools and, and actually you can even um, search for those and, and run tests on any on an, any website you want for um, to get a score. Yeah, just to add to what Rob was saying, um, aside from the fact that there are companies that will do for you and there are online accessibility checkers. The other thing that you can do is actually just um, get feedback. From your from your users from your visitors, so that's one thing we are planning on doing. Dan, we've um, now that we've launched it, uh, we're we and we want feedback from everybody around the the um, the website, but specifically we want accessibility feedback. So we will be and you'll be seeing it on the website where we we will be serving a quick uh, survey to uh, any visitor, not just parents, um, staff, students, but anyone who's visiting our website and ask them how they found the experience on the website. So that's another way that you can gather feedback. A good and question. To that, to that right. point, we, we do also have the accessibility feedback form that gives um, our users an opportunity to provide feedback on um, both the locations, like um, you know, from, uh, from whether it's at a school level, um, customer service or the website. So, do you want to uh, show them that quickly, Rob? Yeah. I know we. I don't think we touched on that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's. I was just actually going to say that that is a super important feature. Yeah. I think the form was really hard to find before, so I love that this is right here. Yeah. So the get to the, it right from the footer. Yeah, the form. So the form is accessible um, on every page through the footer. Um, and also obviously through search, but um, instead of a you know PDF, fill it in send it in, email us kind of thing. Uh, it's all done through a Google form. So we would get um, this information instantly and then it's uh, channeled to the the, the, the proper department um, to address the concern. So any user would be able to quickly fill in their uh, email address, name, date, and then a drop down list of location if it was um, physical barrier. Um, or an accessibility barrier, they can they can choose from one of these options and continue to even add to it if we need to be more specific. That is absolutely great. And I, uh, uh, the question was just because this is it's not a straightforward thing. It's uh, quite tricky. You can have uh, different tools or a particular feature work in JAWS, for instance, but not with NVDA or something like that. So 
it, it is by no means uh, straightforward and, uh, and easy. And, and the other question had to do with the documents that are stored, like PDFs and so on, uh, on the website. Are those made compliant as well, or is it just the web page? Are you talking about PDF documents? Correct. Well, so Andrea touched on it. Andrea, I'll let you speak to it, but the goal is that uh, as we transition, it is a workflow sort of restructuring, um, but moving away from, from PDFs, uh, there's a number of reasons why. One is site speed, uh, one is search capabilities. Um, there's a lot of reasons we want to move away from PDF and accessibility is one of them, um, even language support. So PDFs can, you know, are accessible in that they are text. They're not necessarily easy to use on mobile devices the way that a website is and reflows content. So that is part of getting to that, you know, the point that we're we're not no longer posting PDFs at all. It's still a work in progress, but uh, yes, it, it's not that it does not meet accessibility standards, but the best best method forward is definitely to create pages versus posting uh, documents. Right. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, awesome. Is there any other questions or um, are we good to move on? Good, okay. Thank you so much, Andrea and Rob. Um, I think, uh, again, uh, you know how impressed I was at the board meeting and I think the accessibility features are great um, and we'll continue to give feedback. So thanks so much for coming and presenting to us tonight. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um, up next, we have our next presentation. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, we have our next presentation, which is pilot, uh, a pilot to support transitions to post-secondary pathways for students with developmental disabilities. Um, so um, joining us tonight is Lisa Vaca, and Lisa is a special education consultant, and Martha uh, Pickett, who are representing uh, the pilot to support transitions. So welcome to both of you, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, first off, I'd like to say congratulations to both you and Maria. Um, and as well, I would like to say that uh, both Martha and I are excited to be with you all tonight. Um, as Brenda mentioned, we will be speaking to you about um, a ministry pilot project that we have been participating um, in for the last two years. Um, and it's this year, this academic year, that we were invited by the ministry um, to share our learnings with our school board community. And uh, that's what brings us uh, to you all tonight. So um, the project is a, a pilot to support transitions to post-secondary pathways for students with developmental disabilities. Um, the pilot was slated to end in June of 2020. But seeing as uh, 2020 has been a very different year um, and we've had a, a number of uh, extenuating circumstances, the pilot has been extended for an additional year. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking to you um, about the, pro the project, providing you with an overview. Uh, we'll talk about some of the products that we have produced and, of course, some of our next steps. And um, before we begin, we're happy to answer questions as we go along. So please, if you do have any questions for us, don't hesitate to ask and uh, feel free to um, let us know. So, um, Andrea, thank you. We are on to our first slide. Um, so once again, uh, the pilot um, project is something that ha has um, aimed at um, two basic um, goals. So firstly, um, it's aimed at improving our outcomes for students with developmental disabilities upon graduation, trying to increase opportunities for them um, out in the community. Uh, traditionally for our students with this population um, of students, uh, there are very limited opportunities for them. And this has been recognized by the, the ministry and by uh, a number of boards within Ontario. And, and that's why one of the goals of the project is to help in that area. A second aim of the pilot project was networking, allowing participating boards to share the best practices and learn from each other. So as you can see, there are eight school boards that are participating in the pilot project. There are two lead boards, uh, the Conseil des Écoles Catholiques de Centre-Est and Durham. And um, these two lead boards had a transition coordinator that was a fully funded position, help, position helping them out with the project. 
um, and this transition coordinator was helping to support schools directly with things like co-op, transition planning, and um, sea ice programs. There are six supporting boards that are participating in the pilot project. We are one of the supporting boards. And as a supporting board, uh, we've had a little bit of discretion as to what we'd like to use from what we've learned from our partners in the project to develop our own resources to improve our practices. Okay, so next slide, please. Thank you. So some of the focus areas uh, from the, uh, the project are, are listed in front of you now. And um, these have come or out of our ministry group meetings. So we have met three times each year over the past two years. And in our meetings, again, we've developed these focal points. So these topics have been topics of interest that have been identified and explored by um, various boards that are part of the project. In June of 2020, um, as a culminating task, uh, the ministry uh, compiled all of our respective contributions in these different areas in a summary report. And in this summary report, again, it outlines and captures all our contributions. So for tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, center our discussions around a, a few key areas. And these areas would be areas that we felt we had notable contributions to. And that includes resources, staff training, um, community partnerships, and career life planning. So at this point in time, I'll turn it over to Martha, who's gonna explore these areas with a little bit more detail. Thank you. So next slide, please. So we were really excited, as Lisa said, to be able to collaborate with the ministry and a number of our partner boards uh, and find out a little bit more about what everyone's best practices were to help them inform our own. Uh, we, we focus, as Lisa alluded to, on two main areas. Um, one was staff resources, uh, because we wanted to look at what we already had in terms of our own um, capabilities and ensure that our our staff had everything that they needed to, to get students to the uh, where they needed to go at 21. So that resulted in the creation of an electronic platform of staff resources using the D2L site. Um, secondly, we wanted to really look at family resources um, and uh, including uh, Community Pathways, My Blueprint area, um, a family transition guide, and also we wanted to share some of our own collaborations with our community partners that support families. Okay, so um, the slide we're looking at right now uh, focuses on that first area of staff training and resources. Um, you know, as someone who was a teacher for a long time and in special ed for a number of years, um, you know, we're all acutely aware that a, a well-prepared shirt is someone who's going to be able to support their students best. So we reviewed our, our existing resources. Um, we, we acquired a number of new ones, and then we created, as we've said, this go-to electronic platform to house everything that search would need to program for their students. Looking at the little uh, visual that you have there, um, running vertically down the left side, it are tabs that are the main core areas of the platform. It's a little hard to see, but I'll illuminate that in a minute. Um, running down the right side, we created the capacity for a feed so we could put upcoming events and you know directives and reminders about important things. And actually running horizontally across the top um, it are connectors to um, resources that certs use all the time and such as the IEP engine or the SHIIT platform. And so what we really wanted was this to be a really core go-to place for them to be able to access all of their resources. Okay, next slide, please. So what we're showing you now is just a little graphic of those tabs I alluded to just a minute ago that are running down the left side. So this is just a graphic representation of what actually is on the platform. And we thought a lot about what should the organizing principle of this be and uh, in alignment with the fact that we were doing a ministry project on transitions, we really wanted transitions to be the focal point. So we then decided to take the transition process and have it lead to all of the other processes that 
create a cyclical flow for our students as they travel through time in school. So each of these areas, uh, transitions, assessment, IEP development, programming, and reporting, and then back to the next transition in time. Um, each of those tabs will start with a preamble in it, and then it is loaded with a variety of information suitable to whatever is required for that topic. So it can be things like checklists, programming information, uh, ministry documents, PowerPoints, instructional videos, and all kinds of other resources. Um, we're mindful that some certs may be new, some certs are experienced, but it is good to have a place to go to um, where you can either review this in its entirety or you can look for the isolated topic that you need more information on. So somebody might need information about reporting and they can go immediately to the reporting tab and look at all the information that's loaded in there. Or they can start with transitions and it will take them through the flow of an entire year for a student. So note as well that in the transition areas we do uh, allude to all of the different types of transitions that occur over, to, over time, starting with entry to school, grade to grade, school to school, and finally school out to the community um, after they're finished. Um, we wanted to say something else that we recently loaded in there and we were feeling that it was very fortunate um, that we had decided to do an electronic platform because when COVID hit, we were able to create a, another tab and immediately start loading into it some virtual programming resources specific to programming during these difficult times um, online. Okay, next slide, please. One of the other things that we, we did was uh, moving on to supporting families. We talked as part of our, our ministry initiative with other um, boards about what, what community resources do you have? How are you connected to your community partners? And we were able to share um, some of our work that we've done as members of the Halton Transition Advisory Committee. Um, we were able to um, give examples of some events that we have hosted and held, and we were able to get some really good ideas moving forward from other boards of other events that, that could be pertinent. The one that you see posted there is the Inspire Accessibility Showcase, which is usually a, a yearly event, and it's a sort of a one-stop shopping day for parents. Um, of uh, third party vendors, community vendors, there are speakers and they can come and get all kinds of information about uh, resources and, and transitions and all sorts of things in the community. Next slide. And back to Lisa. Hey, thanks, Martha. Um, so I'm thrilled to talk about this next slide and uh, the idea of career life planning um, for our students. Um, just a bit of a background, um, we have uh, my blueprint that is available for uh, as a tool for all our students in grades 7 to 12 to work on their IPP or um, individualized pathways plan. So my blueprint, of course, is, is a web based education career planning tool. And again, it can be shared with parents. It can be shared with teachers, community personnel, etc. Um, so we have now developed a community pathway section for uh, my blueprint platform and um, our aim again is to have that one stop shop for our parents and students to find information uh, that's going to help them with their pathways and help them to plan for the future. And what we've put on the platform um, or the, the section, I'm sorry, is uh, some pathways information a family guide that outlines transition processes. And this is currently in development in draft form, but we're gonna to speak to that a little bit later. And also we're gonna, we have a section on uh, community events and um, helpful websites. So the community pathway section of my blueprint is um, nearly complete. We've shared all content with um, my blueprint um, and we're just waiting for a few setup items to be finished by them um, so that we can get this up and running for everyone. Now, as I've mentioned, a key part of the community pathway section of my blueprint that uh, we've um, created is the family transition guide. And that's gonna be something that Martha's gonna talk to us a little bit more about just now. So next slide, please. So as Lisa had said, um, we created the community pathway section of, 
of my blueprint. And we thought that the, the value of having resources loaded onto this type of platform was we could create different areas. Um, one thing we noticed in our research and in our discussions with some of our, our community partners and our partner boards at the ministry was there's a lot of information out there online, but it isn't always up to date and it isn't always accurate. And we wanted to be able to create something that would allow a fluid area. So that's the My Blueprint part, which would have websites that change over time. Sometimes a website's up and running and then sometimes it's not. So we could monitor that. And then we wanted to have the more core resource be uh, a family transition guide um, that would be at the centerpiece of it. So this, this guide would be the constant, the information in it is information that is um, something that wouldn't change over time. And um, what it would be is a guide that helps families go through the transition journey and provides stu uh, tools for that process. Um, we designed it based upon, uh, first of all, uh, other boards uh, on our ministry project who had designed such guides and had had a lot of positive feedback from parents and families about it. So we thought that that was something that our, our own families would benefit from very much. So I'm going to just uh, flip to the next slide and we can show you a little bit of what's in it. Uh, what we did was we, we took the guides from some of our partner boards. We also looked all around the province at what guides were up and running. And then we extracted um, some of the core concepts or core ideas. And then we created our own guide um, based upon the needs in our own community. And the structure of it is a little bit like a journey through time. I think for, for families um, of students with developmental disabilities, um, there's always a lot of information coming at them and sometimes that information can be confusing and overwhelming. Um, so we wanted to give them something that they could look at and that could be a process. So let's look at what's in it. We do a brief preamble about transitions. Uh, and then we talk about the, the key stakeholders and what everyone's role is. So families at home, our community partners, and when, young, when youngsters are, are little, um, the organizations that start coming into play most commonly at our transition meetings are Halton Support Services and community living organizations. And then we do a little discussion of what to expect through the school year. So elementary school, that really important transition to high school, and then what to expect during high school. At this point, we, we bring in the other, um, the other partners who are important to, uh, to remember at this time, uh, one being Developmental Services Ontario and the other being ODSP. And then we have another section on transitioning from high school to adult life. Um, we've also included um, appendices with this guide uh, with a few key items for parents based on things that we thought were really good ideas. And, and in my own experience of having been at many transition meetings with parents, um, A, uh, an appendix on a description of potential post-secondary pathways for students with developmental disabilities. Typically, what are these? Um, an appendix B, um, on an integrated transition planning checklist for students with developmental disabilities that families can use to just over time make sure that they're hitting all of those markers. So things like applying for ODSP, um, having you know um, regular transition meetings. And this is something that the parent has. We, as you will remember from earlier, we have our own staff platform and that holds checklists that our certs would use for transition meetings. But this one belongs to parents. Um, finally, in Appendix C, uh, a lot of guides included um, questions that you might that parents and families might want to ask at meetings, and we thought that that was also um, a good a good inclusion point. Um, so that that is the, the the rough draft version of this, and um, you know we're going to be at least we'll be speaking in a minute or two about uh, that we're sort of at the vetting stage at, at now. We've We've gathered together what we think are, are the best features of the, the best of these guides and tried not to make it too cumbersome and tried to make it uh, reader friendly and, and family friendly. And um, so we're hoping that it will be a, a huge help to our, our families. Okay, Lisa, next slide. Okay. 
So what's next for us? Um, as Martha just mentioned, um, we'd really like that if you do have an opportunity, we'd appreciate any feedback that you could provide for the family transition um, guide in, that's in draft form right now. Um, so what we're planning on doing is we're, we're planning on sending you all an electronic version of the, the guide along with a Microsoft form. And in, in this form, if you can submit any, any suggestions you might have, um, that would be helpful. Um, we really value your input and, and we hope to get, you know, um, suggestions from you if you have time. Uh, of course, we're looking to have this um, within the next couple of weeks if, if it's at all possible. Um, and the time frame we're looking to uh, get it done by is by mid to late February. I think we've asked for a February 18th uh, date. So again, we'd really love to have your input if you could help us out with that. Um, next item uh, that we'd like to continue on with is, of course, developing transitioning planning processes and resources uh, available uh, on my blueprint. We do have another um, thought, uh, again, like uh, Rob had mentioned in his presentation, the, uh, the site is not going to be static. We're going to be adding to it as we uh, come along with new ideas or, or new pieces that we would like to input in it. And one thing that we're looking at is, is a student portfolio. We do have a ministry meeting scheduled tomorrow, and one of the topics of this ministry meeting will be student portfolio. So hopefully we can get some um, ideas there and, and consider enhancing our, uh, prod, uh, our product for the Community Pathway section. We're going to continue to add further resources and refining what we do have on our D2L platform for our staff use. Uh, we will also uh, in service all of our CLC, STC and life skills certs on the use of the community pathway section of my blueprint. We've already worked really uh, closely with John T G Dietrich, excuse me, um, from Student Success and one of his pathways itineraries itinerants, Christina uh, Gilchrist will be helping us with that in servicing. Uh, once my blueprint is up and, and ready to go, um, we'll uh, make those arrangements to set that up. Um, and finally, we're going to continue to meet our commitments to collaborate with um, the ministry project um, and our commitment to it for the remainder of the school year. Um, so, uh, finally, I'd just like to thank and acknowledge as well um, our senior administrators, our superintendent, our director, our, our special education coordinator for their support um, in, in allowing us to have uh, be part of this project, for our participation in the project. Again, I think that we're all committed um, to improving uh, outcomes for our students and um, improving the transition proce process that we have here at Halton Catholic. So uh, I guess at this time, if there are any questions for us, we'll be happy to entertain those. Great, thank you so much. Um, I know I have a question, but I'm gonna open the floor if there's anyone else that has questions. <clears throat> and if not, I can jump in and then if anybody has a question, please feel free to put their hand up. Oh, okay, Maria, I see you. Do you wanna go ahead? Sure. Um, I had a couple of questions. So I want to understand. Um, it talks about uh, the different transitions being community settings, work, or college. So does community settings does that include students who are going to just um, continue to live at home, maybe not be working, not go to college, as well as those who may live in a care home? Is that what community does that capture? Does community settings capture all of that, or yeah. what does that mean? Yes, yes, it does actually, Marianne. Thanks for asking that question. Um, we we delineate five pathways, and um, it starts with um, home, being at home, uh, being out at day programs, potentially being at work, or being at um, college. So there are there are five potential areas where students can be, and it can be a, a, any number of those, right? So a student may transition from a day program into a workplace. Um, so it, it does capture all of those because our students with developmental disabilities do have a great range. Right. So and it, is that something that would be identified in their IEP um, in their transition plan? And at what point do you kind of make that determination? I'm wondering. That's a really good question. You know, um, from my own experience, we've when we look at, for example, that family transition guide, we think about elementary school. Um, often. Families are still on a journey to deciding that, you know, the, the, the developmental disability is unfolding over time. 
And so generally speaking, by about grade seven and eight, when it's been determined, usually that a student would benefit more from alternative programming rather than provincial programming, that's when those discussions start to occur in earnest. And I think what we all have to be aware of is, of course, that is, that's also a flexible outcome. Students never stop surprising me over time. But it's around that time that those discussions could be starting and should be starting. Certainly coming into secondary school, it's very important to be having a discussion about what, what parents and families and does everyone see the potential pathway the same way. So it's a good idea to, to, to describe those different pathways. Um, and understand, and then that informs the IEP as to what should the program, what should the programming look like? It should be suitable to what, what families feel and, and educators feel that that potential outcome is going to be. Thank you. And I, I have sort of one more, if that's okay, Brenda, or um, do I go ahead, me? Uh, no, that's okay, Brenda. Right? I'm okay. good. Yeah. So just, and just to make sure I'm understanding. So this is, the use of my blueprint is sort of the pilot that you're working on. So I don't I don't know if transition planning is currently happening in my blueprint, but I'm so that's one question. And then are if it is now or even for the future, so are parents trained on that or will they be trained on that? Because um, you know, a lot of our students can can show their parents my blueprint, but but these students can't necessarily. So do, are the parents getting that training so that they're right you know involved in that process? And I guess related if we're not using my blueprint fully yet I guess all of this information would be in the IEP so does the IEP currently have the kind of detail that we're hearing about that will be kind of in this um, my blueprint maybe in the future is that cu currently contained in the IEP because that's quite a bit of detail and and, and uh, hopefully it is that would be great but I'm just kind of wondering mm -hmm. about the current state well <laughs> I think, I think, sorry, Lisa, do you want me to? Yeah, so maybe I'll start and then you, yeah, you go ahead. You can. Yeah. yeah, so right now um, with my blueprint, uh, we are working, like I said, closely with um, student success and John Dietrich, and we can look about um, how or if there will be parent training that could be provided to support our parents. Um, but that's something that was a good question and, and a, a really huge consideration. And in terms of... Um, what is on the IEP in the transition plan are we pride ourselves in having robust transition plans for our students. So a lot of information is outlined in the transition plans for our students um, as well. So I don't know, Martha, if there's something else that you'd like to add. Yeah, I think it's it's really contained in, in two places. And, and one would be the alternative programming areas of the IEP that typically for these students are delineated as communication literacy, communication numeracy, daily living and, and social skills. And those alternative programming areas are, are then reflected in the transition pieces in the transition plan um, that dictate what's driving us to program as we are for a particular student at a particular level. So based upon assessments and data, and then the IEP has been put together. So it's, it's a complex document that does house those pieces and somewhat separately, depending on what you're looking for. I mean, at the moment, the, the Community Pathways area serves as an information repository, um, mainly for, for families to be that go-to place to find out um, about what's available to them at school and, and in their communities. Um, one of the things we are looking at with the ministry and our partner boy, boards is the potential for um, uh, portfolio areas or activity areas that would be a more of an interactive play that that currently is is not housed on the platform, um, but that is something we'll be getting more information about. Um, anything else, Lisa? I think that speaks to it. No, I think that was um, yeah, an important part to add as well of okay. the student portfolios and that we want to enhance it. But as you mentioned, it's um, not up on our site right now. It's it's more the information providing uh, resource. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, uh -huh. and, and I also want to say thank you very much for um, providing that presentation in advance. Uh, gave us an opportunity to sort of have a quick read. And be prepared. So I appreciated that. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, hi guys. Uh, hi. 
Thank, thanks so much for the presentation. Transitions is always something that we're discussing a lot uh, with this group. Um, I just had a question around the transition guide. Um, so, so help me understand a little bit more about how that is going to be provided to families. Um, I always worry. I always worry that we develop these amazing tools and resources, and that we don't always get them into the hands of of families and parents. And and I just um, I'm wondering, you know, for this transition guide, it sounds like a lot of work has gone into it. The information is plenty plentiful and very helpful. How are we going to ensure that parents are seeing this document and that they have access to this document? That's a really so, great question, Brenda. And Lisa and I, we've discussed this extensively. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think one of the things we've concluded is it may be a different story for elementary than it is for a secondary. Um, I do think the guide uh, has important information in it um, for parents of students with developmental disabilities in elementary school, provided that the identification is fully agreed upon. Um, you want people to have information when they're ready for it. And it's been my experience sometimes that if, if we gave people information um, when they weren't quite ready, um, sometimes it, it, it pushed them away. So I would say in elementary, uh, when a student has been identified as having a, a developmental disability, when that identification comes in, it could be, you know, right out of the gate. It could be in grade two, grade three, grade five. Um, at that point, the search should be instructed to share the guide with parents. Um, in secondary, it should be something that is brought to light uh, right at the very first uh, meeting juncture um, or the very first opportunity that the school has. It's usually uh, there's a transition meeting coming into secondary. I would make sure it's available then and then ensure that parents have uh, access and families have access to uh, to my blueprint once all of that's up and running. Um, and it could be as a standalone piece. Schools should know it's there. It's electronic, so it's easy to share. Um, and it's easy to make sure that it, it finds its way into the hands of, of the people who need it. Because I do agree with you, a, a, a resource that sits there is not helpful to anyone. Mm -hmm. and, and just to add what uh, Martha is saying, so uh, again, that's one of the reasons why we placed it on our, our community pathway section of my blueprint. Uh, again, it's geared for those students in those grades 7 to 12 years, so in the intermediate years. Most of our, our families recognize um, the pathway or, or, or more interested in the pathway for their uh, child. And this family transition guide that we've developed is really geared for this age group. And that would be the most pertinent uh, spot for them to access it is uh, on their own as well is in um, my blueprint. Uh, thank you. So just to follow up. So will this be available as a resource on our regular HCDSB website as well? I don't see why not, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I guess we, we can add it there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it will be on my blueprint for sure, which will, parents would have access to, yeah. Yeah, again, I mean, I think also just back to Maria's point a little bit um, about accessing my blueprint is, you know, I know that it's a great program, um, you know, but I do think that there might be sometimes that parents are not able to access it as fluidly as we would like or mm -hmm. um, as effectively mm -hmm. as we like. And I'll, I'll, ca I'll count myself <laughs> in that <laughs> population. <laughs> but um, I just think, you know, the more resources that we can make available under our spec ed section that families can access. Um, and you're right. I mean, listen, this is something that someone in, make, in, in grade three may not need to know or grade four, but we do have families that start the planning process that early. Um, mm -hmm. So even if it hasn't been formally presented to them because it's not part of that plan at that time, um, you know, for those parents who do want to go and take a look, um, they can at least get a flavor for what that transition planning might look like. So that'd be my, you know, sort of my my wanting to have it as part of a resource on our website um, if there's consideration for that. Yeah, I don't Absolutely. see why we would mm -hmm. take it back to leadership. Mm -hmm. And I like the suggestion, like like you're saying, Brenda, you know, when people are ready, they might be, you know, lukewarm to looking at something or they might have time to look at something. Um, and if it's easily accessible, the, the more exposure that we can get to help people understanding the process and helping them with the transition process. Um, yeah, I see that as a, a benefit for sure. Perfect. Um, Deborah, I see you have your hand up. Did you have a question? 
Hi, yes. Hi. Um, great presentation. Thank you. It, it's actually uh, along the lines of what Brenda is saying with the, I was going to say about the website, having the guide accessible, um, I think would be really important for parents then. I, I can understand uh, how it was mentioned earlier that providing information too early, um, it can be scary even for parents, uh, overwhelming, um, but there are some who are uh, may want to see that information ahead of time. I'm even thinking of those children who are coming into first year kindergarten uh, with diagnoses already. We, I, I heard it mentioned about grade two, three, um, but we're, I'm going to guess that we're going to see more children, uh, specifically from an autism perspective, getting diagnosed early and earlier and earlier, like age two and whatnot outside of the board. So um, you know, it, it might be helpful, even though they're not going to be thinking of those type of transitions so much later. They just want to get through, um, you know, getting into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's still, I would say it's still um, a form of almost reassurance and comfort with the board and seeing that, okay, there's this guide here. There, it, there is a long-term plan for, for my child. I, I know pers from a parental perspective, um, that's something I would like to see anyway, and, and I'm sure uh, many parents of of students um, coming into, I know kindergarten is a scary thing when you're dealing with uh, autism and they're really little. So I just think some, yeah, accessibility to that is going to be, is going to be important. I, I, I totally agree with you, and especially from the perspective that one of the things we're careful to delineate in the guide is who those community partners are. Um, that are going to be helpful along the way. And it's certainly if a student comes into school, you know, in, in, into uh, kindergarten with a, already with a diagnosis, those community partners need to be in play, Halton Support Services most specifically, right? So I agree with you very much, and, and we thank you for suggesting that it should be on the site because I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Myself as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I don't see any other hands up in the chat. Um, so we look forward to, we absolutely look forward to the opportunity to review. So thank you for that. Um, I know that our group is always, always happy to provide feedback. Um, so thank you for taking that into consideration. And, and I, you know, I know that there's probably many of us that can't wait to, to do that. So thank you for including us in that. In that. Um, and like I said, we look forward to that and, um, if anybody has any questions, um, you know, I'm sure that they will feel free to reach out to you guys uh, for more information. But thank you again so much for spending time with us tonight and going over this. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thanks everyone. Thanks, Brenda. All right, you're welcome. Okay. Thanks guys, have a great yeah. night. You too. too. Um, okay. Um, so just moving on to item number four, declarations of conflict of interest. Do we have any declarations of conflicts of interest this evening? No? Okay. Uh, next is business arising. Do you have that, Andrea, to put up on the screen by chance? <clears throat> so I know that one of the items that we had was um, to discuss um, transition planning, which is which is really in line with the presentation we had tonight. But I know that there was a conversation about proposing um, a subcommittee um, to um, discuss that. Sorry, I just need to make my screen a bit bigger. Sorry, Andrea. My multifocal glasses are coming Wednesday night. <laughs> so I'll be able to see with these old eyes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, so that had come out of the uh, uh, ABC Association report, a uh, conversation about the subcommittee to talk about transition. Um, so it's there on our business arising. Um, I know that we were going to bring it back for a discussion this evening if that was something that we wanted to do. Uh, so I open it up to uh, the committee members around that piece. Do we want to form a committee? Does somebody want to take that on? Um, is there any feedback on that? And if not, that's OK. We can leave it on business arising, but I wanted to make sure we didn't ignore it because we did give it a, an end date. 
<clears throat> yeah, Maria, go ahead. So I guess from ABC's perspective, um, certainly we were looking to see if there was interest in a, in a subcommittee. Um, we also suggested a future agenda item to for further discussion. Um, but I, I don't want to leave it on the business arising per se, because we did have very specific concerns for the gifted population. So, you know, we can take that offline and work with staff if, if there's not interest in doing something at SEAC. Um, you know, we brought the concerns forth originally during the spec ed plan review. So, you know, we're coming up to a year. Um, so we'd like to move forward in some way um, and we're happy to consider, you know, different options, but, um, you know, and, and really happy if we can make this something that addresses is issues that all associations might have and, and different exceptionalities but in one way or another we'd like to to address the concerns that we specifically had so okay so if we look at it maybe from two different i mean if i sort of break it up into two i'm, I'm thinking um that certainly there's the, there's the abc piece um that i know that you did have specific um concerns and recommendations and some thoughts that you wanted to be able to discuss and have feedback on um, and then I do think there is that piece about the subcommittee. And I, and I, I don't think that that's a bad idea. Transitions um, consistently comes up. It's something that, um, you know, we're being asked um, with this presentation to comment on. Um, I know that it's something that, again, comes up and up and it just it's always there. So I actually don't think it's a, a bad idea if we wanted to put together a subcommittee um, to talk about um, transition and how they affect all of our different uh, populations. Um, yeah, I just want sorry. sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but yeah, just to be clear, I fully support that. I just I don't want to be. Yeah, the oh, no, I know you. I don't want yeah. to be the only person on the subcommittee or a subcommittee of two. So if we're right. gonna have a subcommittee, yes. you know, there needs to be, to be more interest. And I so, agree. yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming from. I agree. So so why don't we um, do this then, Maria? Is I think the one piece, like you said, can probably come offline in the sense that I know that they're specific to ABC, but if we break that out and look at that subcommittee piece that we could you know, use to um, discuss transition with our entire group, um, I think we should do that. So, I mean, I'd be happy to be on that committee. Uh, I think, Deborah, you put your hand up that you'd be happy to, to be on that committee. Um, you know, Maria's got some interest. Um, Perfect. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, and if, if we can cover our, our, you know, and we can decide what's the best way, because we don't yeah. want the committee to be focused on one exceptionality either. But if we can address our concerns through the subcommittee process, you know, then then maybe we don't need to take it offline or we just take yeah. a bit of like, you know, we can decide that. But I, I'm definitely supportive of the subcommittee. Don't get me wrong about that at all. So okay. you know, it looks like there's a little bit of interest. So, yeah. So what we could do then is, I mean, we've got a month till our next meeting. We could try to get together and at least have at least, you know, maybe one Teams meeting um, for those who are interested. I'm happy to put that together. You know, Maria, you, Maria, you and I can maybe talk about a date that might work and I can set that Teams meeting up and send an invite. Um, you know, I can send the invite to, you know, everybody on SEAC and, and if you decide that you want to participate in it, just let us know. And then we can form our subcommittee from there and maybe have a preliminary conversation on, you know, what this would look like, what our goals look like, uh, what is it that we're, you know, we're hoping to achieve. And then um, if we can do that, then we can talk about it at our February meeting with at least a first sort of meeting of our of our subcommittee. That works. Okay, Marianna, you says sounds good. Deborah says sound good. Okay. And I'd love it for anyone else that has questions or concerns or anything about transitions. I'd love your thoughts and your participation. It doesn't have to be um, all encompassing, but you know, the more perspectives we have, um, the better on the subcommittees. So I'll set that up. We'll send that out. And if you decide that you want to join, we'd love to have you. Does that work? That sounds good, Brenda. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, so we'll... Um, Okay, so we'll just leave it. I'm doing quote air quote. Maria, we'll leave it there. We can change that perhaps date um, or we can put an additional note about coming back in February. So uh, let's leave it there, not permanent, but let's leave it there for now because we do have some action on it if that works for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just don't want it to fall off. Yeah, I'm okay, yeah I, I'm okay with leaving it there, just not as a like. Yeah, forever. Like a technology I, I can see some, some, some forward motion yeah. on it at least at this yeah. point. For sure. Okay. Okay. Awesome.
Um, okay, and so I think that was, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, so six special education board policy reviews. We didn't have any board policies to come through to SEAC for review. Um, item number seven, uh, SEAC goal setting chart. So we talked about this in the December meeting. So we're gonna pull this up and we can um, assign some dates and responsibilities to them and just make sure that we had captured everything from our, our goals. Can I make a comment, Brenda? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know that on this chart we talk about subcommittees as well, and, and I think that reflects the fact that, you know, we can only do so much in our monthly meetings. And I just want to say on CPIC, we have three subcommittee um, subcommittees going, and um, most people are part of at least one. And there's a lot of, like, the subcommittee really lets you get down to the details and get some work done. And our CPIC meetings themselves run really efficiently. Um, and, and I think maybe that's part of the reason, right? The, the detailed conversations are happening outside. Then we sort of come back with, with a, an overview. So I'm just, I'm trying to sell the subcommittees. I don't know if that's doing it, but, uh. <laughs> no, I, you know what? I agree. And I'll give another example of that, Maria, when we did the international day of persons with disabilities, um, you know, that was a huge venture and we broke that into subcommittees and holy moly, like when we came together for a meeting, um, you know, it was, you know, bang on. So if it was a, you know, conversation about elementary, high school, rollout, whatever that was, the subcommittee did, you know, the bulk of their work, reported it back to uh, the group, and it just allowed us to move the process through uh, really much quicker. So, uh, you know me, I'm always in favor of subcommittees, and I participated on those as much as I can. Uh, so I agree with you. I, I encourage members to be a part of it. It just allows us to get more work done. Um, and to move things forward in a quicker manner, but it has to be a shared, I think a shared activity. Um, Deborah, you have your hand up, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, it, it's, um, I think the subcommittees are are a fantastic idea, um, but I, I do uh, think I can understand why people might be a little, um, maybe hesitant, uh, you know, amount of time we all have can be limited. So I think if, if uh, you know, um, I don't know how I'm trying to say this, but kind of having a framework for how much time subcommittees are going to work on something. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to make it more um, appealing to people who might have really full plates going yeah. on and thinking of like extra uh, meetings or discussion outside of this monthly meeting might be concerning. And then people might may not uh, volunteer for the committee. I, I don't know. It's just... Um, yeah, I haven't. I haven't. I, I. I'll be honest. I haven't been on one before, so I'm not sure how it runs. But uh, that was just uh, something I wanted to share. Yeah. So it. It really. I mean, that's a really good point, and I think a lot of it depends on the subcommittee and and what goals you've put forth or what the project you have at hand. But you know, for a lot of them, you know, and Maria, you can correct me, but I mean, for the ones that I've been sitting on. You know, we don't even meet weekly. You know, sometimes it's, you know, we meet once a month or twice a month. We might meet for, an, you know, an hour and a bit. People will do their little piece and come back. So, you know, it, I think a lot of it is dependent on the committee itself, like I said, and what it is you're working on. Um, is it a large undertaking or is it, you know, not as complex? Um, and, you know, and, and I think that's how you can manage it. Uh, yeah, Maria, do you want to pipe in? Well, I was just going to say, I think one of the advantages too with um, the subcommittee is you can you can do some of your work by email, probably a bit easier. The group's a bit smaller. And for example, on CPIC, now this is a little bit unique, but I'm on the um, subcommittee that's reviewing the bylaws. So we had a shared document. Everyone goes in and puts in their comments. If somebody already said, you know, what you were going to say, you just put agreed. So it can be efficient that way. And and um, and then people can, can um, contribute sort of work it within their own schedule, right? Like I, I reviewed the the document late at night because that's when I do a lot of my work. But no one's going to want to meet then. But right. Um. So it it does allow for a bit more flexibility. Um. And uh, so I think that's that's one benefit. I mean, I I hear you, um, Deborah. I, I understand that, and that's why I was trying to say like, well, maybe our CF meetings might be a bit shorter, um, if we're having these other meetings. But but um, it still would require you know another entry in your calendar for sure so there is that but um, I think that's another benefit too 
is a flexibility. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's the thing, right, is with technology, you can work on those documents, those shared documents, um, and you can do it at your leisure and, uh, you know, send it back to the group for review. So, um, you know, I, th I think that's the way that we can probably set up our subcommittees. That's the way that I've worked on them many ways. Okay, so having said that, uh, our first item that we have up there is a subcommittee to look at uh, the board-wide special education parent survey uh, for all exceptionalities. So I know that that was a goal that we had um, and to work with research and see what that would look like. Um, so I, I do think the best way to do that is with a subcommittee um, so that you know we can dive in a little bit and then the subcommittee can work on it and report back to, to SEAC. Um, so we need a target date for that. Um, and I need people on the subcommittee. If that's a goal that we wanna move forward. Again, these are pulled from our discussion in December. So if there's something here that, you know, that people are not keen on, on participating in and we don't have the, the group to do it, then you know we can move that down the list a little bit. Um, but this is the first piece, so I, you know I welcome comments, questions. <clears throat> There's so, got to be more people on here than Maria and I tonight. <laughs> Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, this is I'm trying to hold up my end here. Oh, I, I, I'm trying. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is the problem. I'm going to probably be interested in like every subcommittee because I just I find this all um, very interesting and I'm passionate about all of it. So um, but uh, I definitely would support this one. I guess I would. I would look for some feedback from from those who have more experience as to what's good timing because I know we hear about survey fatigue and you know you know, parents you want to do it at a time that there's going to be interest and parents haven't just done three other surveys um I do recall a couple of years ago uh, the one survey I can't remember the name of it um that went out to all parents I think it went out at the end of the year and there were some questions in there about that we're quite specific to spec ed and i'm wondering like that could be a starting point right like maybe pull out some of those questions maybe tweak them a bit um but have it as a separate survey that's that's specific to spec ed that's a possibility i i like this initiative because i think that it should help in for our work um to be hearing from our stakeholders um so i'm just not sure kind of what's the best timing that that because we want to get a good response. So is it better to do it at the end of the year um, or in September or, you know, and I don't know if anyone here today has the answers to those things, but I, I would certainly be supportive of and interested in the subcommittee to work on, on this, this one. So I think what we could maybe do for that, Maria, is if I look at the target date and I think about it, maybe the target date becomes um, for us to start the process as far as the subcommittee meetings and engaging with research and getting all of that information put together and coming back as opposed to the target, like as opposed to like an end date, um, because you're right, we don't know when we would want to send it out. What would it look like? How long would it be? All those sorts of things. We definitely have to engage. I'd want to bring in corporate communications probably into that conversation. So maybe what we do is we just put here a target date to start and, um, you know, we can pick really we can pick anything i i'm happy to be on that as well um because I, I i just think it's a good idea also nancy's put her hand up that she would be oh pat has his hand up um so yeah we can maybe take a look at that diane i know that you have your hand up but i'm just going to open it up to pat for a second because i think he wants to maybe speak to this thanks uh brenda and and just so um and it kind of comes down to that that timing perspective a little bit and the role of um research services uh, so over the next several months we do have school climate survey to, to go out which goes out to essentially all elementary or most elementary and secondary students uh, strap plan survey uh, potentially a census survey uh, the end of year strategic plan update survey that we do to kind of judge where we are so there is a lot kind of coming in uh, what's left of the winter and the spring 
Okay. So that's um, so that's helpful, uh, Pat. Um, yeah, I think that's helpful, and and that gives us an idea of when we might be able to roll that out. Um, Diane, you had your hand up. Um, yes, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. You're muted now, Diane. There you go. You're unmuted now. We should be able to hear you. Yes, I'm sorry. That's um, okay. I just did a survey a few years back, the same sort of scenario, and I was wondering if you have access to that, uh, just to see what the requirements were or how we fared in that one. And so that may give us a guide uh, for the coming, any coming um, surveys that we do. Did we improve in certain areas? Um, are we still having difficulties? that we may have had prior, in prior times, I don't know. Yeah, so that could be a good starting point. So I, I, I do think we just need to, um, I think we just need to, to uh, pull the, you know, just go with this. Um, I think that's a great idea, Diane. I think if we can sit down and maybe have a preliminary meeting with a couple of the subcommittee members, discuss things with research, see what surveys were out there before. Maria, you referenced the, you know questions that have come up before in a larger survey. I think those. I think we have to start there because I, I think that's the the basis, and then we decide where we want to go from there. So you know, I I would look at a target date of trying to have a meeting, um, perhaps you know before our next SEAC meeting. Um, that would be my suggestion to keep this moving forward. And at least then at that point, the subcommittee can have come back to the SEAC group to say, we talked to research, we talked to communications, we have access to this, we've taken a look at this, um, and this is the information that we've gathered. And then, you know, sort of here are our next steps. That would be my suggestion on how to get this rolling. Yes. No. I think that I think that sounds good, Brendan. Maybe we're getting into the weeds a little bit too much, yes. even, right? So yes, yeah, uh, I agree. Okay, so let's set that. So Andrea, can you maybe just put their, um, you know, um, target date uh, for subcommittee? Um, I think to meet maybe by mid February. And I can do the same thing. I can send out a Teams. Or Maria, maybe you and I can connect offline and figure out how do we want to do that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So let me make. I'll have note. to learn how to do Teams invites. Well, I can do the Teams part for you. We'll just talk yeah. about timing and who we, you know, who we want to involve. Yeah. And I don't mind. I mean, I. It might be handy, anyways. But yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So that's good. Done. That's for the survey. Okay, so item number two, um, the self-assessment piece. Um, sorry, self-assessment process, SEAC, calendar for SEAC plans. <clears throat> okay, does anybody have any comments on this one? I know that this was a big one for you, Paul, right? Is Paul on the call tonight? Nope. Okay. No sorry, comments on that one. Sorry, sorry, Brenda. It is Paul. I'm having okay. major late latency issues and I'm hearing one third of the conversation. Oh, sorry. I, I think it's my computer. But anyway, yes, I I it would be something I'd be willing to work on. Uh, you, know, you know, you put me down or whatever, but I think if we you know, again, some don't want to create too many subcommittees. But if uh, a few of us could get together and come back and, and you know, on a two or page, one or two page outline, just say, hey, here's what we step, and here's the goals, here's what the uh, the survey looks like, and when could we put it in effect would be great. So. Okay, so Paul, would that be something that you would be willing to lead and communicate to the other SEAC members if they're willing to participate in that? Oh no, I wasn't volunteering to do any work. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. You guys are killing me. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, you would do that for me, Paul? Yes. Okay, awesome. That is yours. 
So um, if you don't mind taking charge on that, we can assign you to that. And I think, you know, again, I know you had a great idea. You were very passionate about that. So maybe just give some thought as to how you'd like to move that forward. And I'm sure we can get some people to help you out with that. Thank you. Again, I didn't hear any of that through. The oh, OK. I, well, we I, can agree always, with we can, I agree with it. OK, <laughs> we can always talk offline, but thank you for volunteering and um, and running with that. This sounds like a great time to assign a lot of things to Paul. It really does. <laughs> um, OK, I, I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so review the results of PAC on SEAC. We're doing that this evening, right? Um, OK. Uh, community engagement. We want to bring back the sound bites, um, which we can do. Um, OK. So again, I know I see another subcommittee there. Why don't we start with the, um, Andrea, is there a way to gather up the um, CX sound bites that we had previously and share those maybe in a in one document with the CX members? I'm thinking like we talked about before to maybe take a look at the ones that we already have as opposed to recreating the wheel. And maybe we just need to do a few edits and that lets us start getting those out. I think those were listed on a page on the website at one point somewhere. Yeah, I think so too. I don't know if they um, still are, but. Yeah, I just, I think if we have them, then we can take a look at them and people can say, yes, relevant, yes, relevant. Let's pump it out. Let's redo this. Um, if we send it out to SEAC. And then at least we have a starting point and we can start resharing those sound bites that were already written that are still relevant. I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think so too. And then, you know, we can, if we don't think we have enough or we think that we have a gap, I mean, we, we might look and say, wow, we've got eight of them. You know, that's that's fantastic. And then I think that's a good starting point. So if yeah. we maybe look at um, pulling those together, and I don't mean to put that on you, Andrea, they might be somewhere. Um, I can see if there is any in Joan. Okay, that would be perfect. Andrea Swindon might know too, if they were, if there was a page on the website or yeah. Uh, Sorry, no. I was just going to type it in that if they were on the website, then we still have access to them and I can uh, I can certainly we can repost them if you like, although it, they're probably in PDF. So we're trying to avoid doing that or I can definitely send them to you. OK, if you can just put the starting point of just sending them to all of us, yeah. Andrea, that would be great. And then we can at least take a look and start putting those out. And at least it's not reinventing the wheel and it's a good starting point, at least to continue that community engagement piece. Sounds good. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. I was going to say, Brenda, as well, like once we start, because a lot of those were written before some of our current members were members. Yes. <clears throat> so they might not be familiar with them. And, um, you know, maybe once we circulate those too, like as you read through them, sometimes it gets your juices flowing on other ideas ideas right jumping off agree. points and so that might be a good uh springboard yeah for sure agree um okay so that's good we'll send that out everybody can take a look um association reports associations could report on how different associations are coping with COVID. oh yes right okay so we have that i mean that's open at any time if any associations want to share um you know, again, for their association reports, things that might be specific to stu how students are handling things right now, if they have any suggestions or ideas for families, um, you know, I would encourage that. I know that a lot of associations have done some wonderful work in keeping families engaged and helping with mental health supports um, and giving, you know, ideas for screen burnout and things like that. So if anybody has them, please share them with us and we can put them into one of our um, upcoming meetings. And that's something that we can share out on Twitter too, if it's a really good resource or something that we can provide to our families also. Um, okay, information, gather requests for staff presentations, survey CAC members on what presentations they would like. Okay. Yeah, and what information they want in the presentation. So that's sort of an ongoing, but I think if we do have some that are pressing that we want to start to make some plans for, 
or get it in the books, um, it's probably better to do that sooner than later. Does anybody have anything top of mind that they would like to see in a presentation or a specific area of spec ed or the board that they'd like to hear more about? Nope. Yes, yes, Stephanie, go ahead. Thanks, Brenda. Um, so we've had some preliminary conversation about this and what we were thinking if SEAC is interested is that we could put together a form, um, so a brief survey just for SEAC with maybe some suggested topics that would be timely and also leave the opportunity for feedback from SEAC members. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Would that would it be possible to get that out before the next meeting? Yeah. Stephanie? Okay. Yeah, amazing. We thought if we could get it out and people could respond, yeah. then we could come back to the February meeting with a list of some topics and then plan from there. Awesome. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, and then I think the final piece is we had talked about you know possibly having some um, some of our meetings where we actually can break out into working groups and discussions. So I think let's keep that in mind when the agendas are being developed if there's an opportunity for us to work on things um, during the meetings. I know it's a little harder with us being online, but there is ways for us to do that. So let's just keep that in mind. That's one of, That was one of our goals as well. Does anybody have any questions or comments on these further to what we discussed already? Nope, okay. Thank you, we'll move on to, oh. I found the soundbite file. Oh, great, thank you so much. Okay, uh, so let's go on to um, item 7.2. Um, a nomination, so uh, we did have a nomination come through. Um, we received from the Learning Disabilities Association of Halton Hamilton uh, for Samantha Sweet to represent their association on SEAC, the LDAAH, uh, H nomination will go to the board meeting on Tuesday, February the 2nd for trustee approval. So I'm really excited about that and looking forward to having um, a rep from um, the LDAH back on our committee. Does anybody have any questions about that? Nope, good, okay. 7.3, uh, PAC on SEAC survey results. Do you have them there, Andrea? Oh, awesome. Okay, so we've left some time here to um, review some of the survey results and to see if anybody wanted to discuss um, any of them in particular or uh, provide any further input to it. Has everyone had a chance to take a look at this? Maria, Rhonda, I think you guys have been involved with PAC on SEAC. Are you, have you seen the results? Do you want to comment at all? Yeah, um, I don't know if Rhonda has anything to say. I um, I was waiting to see if anyone else wanted to say anything, but I actually, um, I was on PAC on SEAC. I'm not currently, but I was actually part of the um, team that designed the survey and reviewed the results um, and did the initial analysis on it. Um, I left just before they, they worked on this final report. Um, so there's definitely sort of a few key things that I can pull out of it that I would like to see further discussion on here. So I can kind of go through those. I don't know if Rhonda had anything she wanted to add, not seeing anything. Um, I guess one of the things that um, I think is universally agreed as a, a, a best practice is um, having the agenda and the materials circulated at least five day, days in advance. 
Um, and I think we had that for this meeting. So I was really happy to see that. We got a copy of the presentation and all of that. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm um, hoping that that's kind of the beginning of, of, uh, of a new trend. Um, it talked about two-way communication with the Board of Trustees being important. Uh, feedback from the board on minutes and responses to motions and minority reports. Um, we don't have a lot of motions and I don't, I don't know if we've ever had a minority report, but um, I, I, I think that's something maybe to consider is uh, I know, know that the board of trustees, um, I know that the SEAC minutes are, are in the, on the board agenda, but they don't really ever talk about them. Um, I know we have some trustees here, but uh, they don't make up the majority of, of the trustees. I know, I know Brenda brings up special education items quite a lot, but just in terms of the Board of Trustees understanding maybe some of the issues that different SEAC members bring forth, especially since we don't have formal motions, that might be something to look at. Um, I'm just trying to go through kind of what I highlighted. And, I, and I'm wondering too if um, everyone here is familiar with the SEAC, the PAC on SEAC Effective Practices Handbook. Um, I know that I we received it at the beginning of my first term. I'm assuming it probably went out to everyone at the beginning of this term as well. I don't remember, but it has a lot of really great information. And I would recommend um, that everyone kind of go through it. Um, and they have a website with great resources as well. Uh, they talk here about a SEAC brochure and only 40% of um, respondents indicating that their board had a SEAC brochure. Um, which is a bit of a decrease from prior years. And that's something that um, I'm wondering if we would consider doing here. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Like I think, you know, we can pull from existing information, but for parents of newly identified students in particular, you know, they're not gonna know about SEAC as, at all. And sometimes it helps to have a parent and or an association that can kind of help them through their journey. Um, so, to receive some information about SEAC might be helpful that includes members and how to get in contact and what we do, links to our meetings, that sort of thing. Um, Maria, sorry, can I just yeah. jump in there right now before, uh, on that point? Yeah. Um, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget while I'm making a note, but um, I think that's, you know, you and I feel very much the same around that. And um, I'm, I'm always also um, sometimes concerned even about our guide to spec ed. Um, that we don't always get it into all of the parents' hands in a timely manner, and it has a lot of great information in there. Um, and so what I'm wondering is, uh, is maybe there's an opportunity for us to take a look at that uh, guide to spec ed and see if there's an opportunity for us to include some additional information on SEAC in that guide. So it's kind of in one sort of brochure um, and we can provide a link on it and then we can put a hyperlink for the digital copy. I'm just wondering if that might be a, maybe a better place to start at this point and, and use that existing guide um, to put some SIAC information. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? So it's interesting that you say that because as I was talking, I remembered that I think that parent guide does have um, something about SEAC. I think it does list the members, but I, I don't remember how much information is in there. And I'm kind of thinking maybe the opposite. Maybe by being kind of buried in there, um, it gets lost and particularly at a time when parents might be overwhelmed. overwhelmed. So um, it's an interesting thought. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but we, you know, we could look at what's there now or, you know, or, I don't know, maybe rearranging where that information is found um, might be another strategy, kind of a compromise. Um, so, and, and another thing that, um, and I think we talked about this in our association report about the transition planning. Um, I know that at some boards, ABC, and I'm assuming other associations as well, when students are newly identified, they receive a brochure about the association, um, which I think is helpful too, because, it, and I think I mentioned this before, like not every parent, who has a child identified with any given ex exceptionality uh, belongs to or even might know about some of these associations that are around the table, you know, not just ABC, but, but any of us. Um, so in order to, to best represent them, how are, we, how are we communicating with these parents that aren't members of our associations and don't, don't know about SEAC? So 
Um, anyways, and then also within this um, within this section, SEAC engagement with community. Now, this refers to all the respondents to the survey, so it's not specific to our board. Um, but it does say that providing information about SEAC available to parents is one of the least effective aspects of SEAC, according to respondents. And it gave a few suggestions. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm happy to, you know, I know I think Andrea Swindon's still on here and had um, stuck around maybe for part of this conversation. They talked about some different things um, through websites and social media um, for not only SEAC awareness, but member recruitment. So, you know, maybe we look at some of those ideas and work with our communications department on some different things that we can do. Uh, I'm thinking too that we can work with our communications subcommittee on that as well, Maria. Right, right. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you wanted to, I mean, you can certainly point us to that or if you want to highlight some of those, yeah. I can pull together that subcommittee and we can have a discussion and then loop in corporate communications on some of those items. Yeah, I mean, there's comments. And again, like, I don't know what board this is, but you know, board website being difficult to navigate. I'm sure a lot of them are. I've been on different boards' websites and, you know, uh, I mean, I think ours is pretty good, um, but some of them are are definitely hard. It's hard to find that SEAC information. We actually have a lot of information about SEAC on our website. I'm just not 100% sure that parents will find it if they don't not, you know, knowing to look for it, that type of thing. So, um, and they talk about the SEAC calendar, which is part, of, is in the pack on SEAC uh, handbook. And I thought that would be something to maybe look at. I looked at it really quickly. I think a lot of the stuff, you know, we're more or less covering. But one thing we've never talked about is the, um, I'm going to say it wrong, the BIP, BIPSA, the Board School Improvement BIPSA. Plan or whatever it is, as something that CX should be um, involved in giving feedback in some way or another. So I thought that might be something that we could consider um, for going forward. And at the end of the executive summary, there is um, some suggested um, action items for C. Yeah, the first one is reviewing this report, so we're doing that. Um, providing a copy of the handbook, which we've maybe done, but maybe could be a refresher. Um, um, and yeah, developing strategies for the sharing of information about CX. So we're talking about that, right, with families and the general community increase to increase awareness and, and encourage public participation in the annual consultation about the spec ed plan. So that's that item that I had brought up during the plan review. That's um, standard number one of spec ed plans is how is the public consulted on the spec ed plan? So I believe we have the plan for our agenda for March coming from staff. Um, and I'm really hoping that that's not just a top down process that SEAC will also have an opportunity to, um, you know, decide how that's going to work. Um, so that, that's recommendation number seven for SEAC's recommendation number eight is circulating the agenda and attachment five days ahead of time, which I already talked about. And number nine, which I already talked about, is promoting two-way communication between SEAC and the Board of Trustees. So those are some things that resonated with me. Um, and I think we talked about doing a stop-start continue you following the review of this so i don't know what the plan is for the timing of that i was wondering if it would make sense if it could be done as like a um a confidential survey so that maybe we have the results for our next meeting well, well maybe our agenda is getting packed i don't know but um just to not kind of drag it out too long so I, those are my thoughts <laughs> I, yeah i think that's what paul was going to that was part of what paul was going to do so okay. um yeah so you know i think if we can get on that uh, i also just had a couple other hands up so i want to get to people diane you had your hand up hello yes we can hear <laughs> You can hear me. This thing doesn't go right. Oh, now you're muted, Diane. <laughs> can you hear me yet? Yes, we can hear you now. It just keeps going on mute for some reason. So we can't hear you now. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. So whatever you're doing, okay. don't touch anything. 
Sorry. Um, I was wondering if we'd have a more comprehensive uh, booklet that does go to parents, a special ed book that goes to a parent servant students who may or uh, may not be newly identified. I've always thought it was quite good, but at the same time you hear a lot of parents say they've never seen it. If we could have something that incorporated a lot of the comments that was made by Maria and others and have it all in a binder or something like that that goes out to parents of students who are either at the identification stage or certainly the concern stage so that parents who are new to the system, maybe uh, first time parents going into the school, uh, they would have a comprehensive um, binder that they could refer to and it could take them uh, further into what's available and what would be best for their child. It seems as though we give them little bits of things and we hold it back until it's time uh, for them to get it. And if they're not really um, into it, or you know, obviously they've got many uh, conflicting demands on their time, they may not realize everything that is available to them prior to going into a specific meeting. So just a thought. I'm going to mute myself now. Thanks, Diane. Um, yeah, so I think a comprehensive, um, you know, um, so Jessica's just saying great idea, uh, like the parent guide. Yes, a comprehensive full package. Um, and I, I, I do agree. And I, and I know that I brought up previously um, an idea behind having some sort of system of checks and balances to ensure that families are receiving that guide at a minimum or receiving those resources. Um, so whether that's something that is placed in their file, the parents have to sign off that they've seen it, um, something like that. Um, so I do think we need a more comprehensive guide to provide to families. And I think we need a mechanism to ensure that families are getting the information because I don't think that they always receive it. Sorry, Maria, Rhonda just had her hand up as well. Um, so, Rhonda, did you have a comment? Yeah, this is going back to um, profiling of SEAC and getting the information out there. So, um, the Hamilton boards asked me to do an online parent video, like a parent-to-parent -parent connection video for uh, parents of children who are already identified, so children entering into the system. And one of the things that I did in that video is I highlighted SEAC the importance of SEAC, what it is, um, what, it, what its function is, um, et cetera. So we used to do that. We at our information night for parents, and I think that's a really important time for us to continue to do that. I don't know what our board's doing in terms of the online piece for parents of children coming into the board, but it's just something to think about that would we should be including um, something about SEAC at that moment for parents. Does that make sense, Brenda? Yeah, it totally okay. makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's something too, Rhonda, that we could always, um, you know, we could always develop a video. There's nothing stopping us. You know, we could work with corporate communications to develop a SEAC, a, a short SEAC video um, that we could post yep. on our website um, that talks about who we are, the different associations. I mean, not to the extent that we had that webinar, but just this is who we are. This is where you find information. This is how we can help you. These are some things you need to know. Um, and we could create a video like that and have okay. that housed on our site so just just to add to that that i'm really dating myself now but we did that about 15 years ago on a cd rom um every member got up and talked about the association but it was a really great initiative yeah. and along that line as well so yeah. because we are online right now and kids coming in the parents are all attending these online meetings and the parent information nights are online it's a good time for us to be profiling SEAC. So it um, doesn't mean that we all have to be there. All, it, it, just one or two parents to talk about what SEAC is and what and what our roles are. So, okay. Yeah, yeah I love that idea. I'll, I think send, you I'll um, send you the video. I'll send you the video, Brenda. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think the video is a great idea. And, you yeah. know, we're seeing more and more of that. I know that the board has just done a new video um, with our land acknowledgement. And, you know, we're taking to do a few more videos to explain things. Pat does a lot of videos. Um, as well. So I, I think it's a great idea and I think we could work with corporate communications to do that. Stephanie, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think that's a great idea as well. I was going to speak to our kindergarten um, special education evening that we're having online for the first time because last year that event took place in person prior to COVID. So um, having some feedback from the group is helpful as we plan uh, what that presentation is going to look like. And it takes place at the end of March. It's March 24th. 
So if we um, could be really mindful to include the SEAC information as well at that time. These are new families. OK, perfect. So Mark, the end of March. Um, yeah, so if we can work with you to put some information together, that'd be great. And um, and, and Andrea uh, Swindon, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the idea of doing a video. I think that's a great idea. Absolutely, Brenda. Love it. OK, perfect. Um, does anybody have? Oh, sorry, Maria, you wanted to ask another question. Uh, it wasn't so much a question. It was kind of a suggestion. And I'm really glad that Andrea Swindon's here. Um, and I've been really hesitant to to bring this up before because I know I can only imagine how busy our communications department has been over the past year with all of this COVID and updating the website and everything else. Um, but, you know, when we were going through the spec ed plan <clears throat> in particular, I thought this is really a well, like no offense, but <laughs> not not just the content, but the layout of the document. Right. It's just a lot of words on a page. And I look at some of the amazing work that our communications department has done with color and graphics, and it's so much easier to read things in that kind of format. So I'm just, and I know, you know, I don't know how much capacity they have to take on additional, and maybe the spike ed plan in particular is is too big of a thing. But in terms of even that that guide that we talked about, or any other material that's out there for parents. We could present the information in a bit more colorful, interesting graphic way. I think it would get um, noticed a lot more. So sorry, Andrea, I don't mean to create work for you, but you guys do great work, so it's a compliment. <laughs> go, go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, no worries, Maria, um, and thank you. I I do think uh, you got cut out, so I'm not sure if you meant the parent information, the parent's guide to special education or the special education plan. Um, I think we have a version of the Parents Guide to Special Education that, if I'm not mistaken, that was turned into a bit of a glossy um, with some images, but I could be mistaken. It could be another another special education um, pamphlet or brochure that we that we redid. But I I agree with you. I. I'm one of those people that if I open something up and there's some people need that level of detail. And I think you you always want to give information um, in in several different formats so that it's applicable to the audience, right? So some people will want to watch a two minute video. Tell me what SIAC is all about. Tell me what special education is about in this board. I just want the you know the Reader's Digest, and and that's all I need. And some people will want the detail um, that's in the the Parents Guide to Special Education, and so it's almost like you you give them different formats. What we did with your guide on our website is we took each section and created its own page. I don't know if you noticed that its own web page, just because it was just so much information, and we figured it's also there in PDF, but we figured a lot of people will not necessarily go through that whereas if you put it in on a web page it's more digestible but I think I I mean I always like infographics I always like you know you know you know the stuff that we do so I I prefer that and I think it, it's it's reaching a broader audience and it's reaching a busy um, parent demographic right now parents are really busy we're all busy but I think that you know the easier you can make it for somebody to to take in the information and then if they want more detail then they can access um you know the more comprehensive guide but uh, you know we're always happy happy to help we just you know we work with um usually we would work through stephanie's um office with a request like this but depending on what you want we we would make time so maybe what we can do and i'm just i'm, I'm Thank you, Andrea. I'm just being cognizant of the time because I know we still have some stuff to get through and it's 10 after nine. And, um, you know, I never want to rush these meetings because I think they're important. But um, I, I'm wondering if what we can do then is there's a, a couple of different items here that would fall under the communications subcommittee. So I've made a note of those and, and I'll uh, go ahead and try to pull together a meeting and perhaps, um, you know, Andrea, maybe Stephanie can join and we can have a conversation about some of these pieces, what we can, what's feasible. Um, that kind of stuff. And then I can bring back a report at the next meeting and, and we can, you know, talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
if everybody's okay with that. And Maria, if you want to go ahead and you know send an email out to the group summarizing you know some of those key points um, that we've discussed tonight from PAC on SEAC that we maybe want to take under consideration, um, I think that's a, a good idea. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm just going to move along. I know that Dan has a present. Thanks, Andrea, for putting that up on the screen. Um, Dan uh, is going to do a presentation for us on World Down Syndrome Day. Dan, sorry it's taken us a while to get to it, but this is always a fantastic event within our board, and um, we love hearing about it. So um, uh, over to you to present this. Thanks, Marina. And um, I guess I'm uh, aware of the time as well, so I'll try to be as short as possible. Uh, all the details are on the web page and on the report itself. So basically, we're uh, super uh, excited to uh, be able to organize the uh, Down Syndrome School uh, Contest, well, the, sorry, <laughs> World Down Syndrome Day School Contest uh, this year as well under, under conditions that uh, we have. Um, basically, uh, the, the year's theme is Share the Joy of Down Syndrome, and I think we all know that there is um, uh, all the uh, students with Down syndrome are, um, uh, we have a lot to learn from them in terms of uh, being joyful and uh, optimistic. Um, and um, I guess the uh, submissions are uh, basically due um, by the end of this month, but I, uh, I got word from the association that we're going to extend the uh, submission uh, deadline uh, because of the conditions that everybody uh, on all the schools are uh, under right now. Um, so looking at the actual um, poster that uh, we have, I guess, uh, is pretty um, visual, so we uh, uh, we have. Uh, I guess we had a lot of uh, success with the previous uh, contest. We we were reaching the message uh, to uh, approximately uh, forty percent of the students in uh, in Halton, and uh, that was a huge, uh, I guess, uh, achievement every year. And um, I guess um, we have the link for, for the contest. The rules are also uh, on the page uh, in terms of the uh, categories that you can register for individually or in group or in uh, with a school. Also, um, I guess prizes and um, uh, all the other uh, timelines for, uh, for the contest and for the submission. The other, uh, I guess, uh, report I want to uh, share in terms of new initiatives. I think uh, everybody and all our members and associations are uh, basically um, challenged with the new conditions we're in uh, without uh, physical contact. And we were trying a lot of, um, I guess, uh, online uh, activities, uh, some of them uh, more successful than others. And I just want to share with uh, the members and the other associations some of the stuff that really went well for HDSA. Um, so um, I guess we have weekly events, um, uh, book club uh, once a week, uh, workouts twice a week. We have a cooking class. Uh, we have music. Um, we have a writing um, uh, event and a movie club on uh, on Friday. And then... Uh, Saturday Night Social with uh, Bingo Trivia Music and the virtual dance program um, uh, that is facilitated by the Dance Ability Movement. Uh, this is a uh, an actual class. It's a program for eight weeks uh, and it uh, happens at all the um, group ages uh, from 2 to uh, 18 plus uh, with the hip hop and uh, other um, I guess dance ability um, or dance teams. Uh, the other uh, workshops that we're doing were fostering and maintaining friendships with uh, tips or advice on how to foster and maintain friendships with typical children that 
uh, that was uh, presented by, uh, uh, I guess, subject matter experts um, in partnership with Warner House. Um, we have uh, for parents, a virtual parent support group, uh, I guess, uh, acknowledging that every family and every parent is, uh, I guess, on a, in, uh, amount uh, of uh, stress load uh, with a virtual uh, learning. And uh, I guess we need to be able to share and to vent. Uh, um, so that we can uh, together get uh, get past this uh, uh, these times right now. Um, I also wanted to share, guys. We tried about three or four uh, uh, types of uh, uh, online uh, meetings, and uh, apparently, it looks like Zoom was the most intuitive and uh, easier for everybody to uh, to use, from uh, parents to students. Um, to stuff, so we uh, we're very pleased to to use that. Um, and looking forward, I guess uh, if we can uh, hear from uh, other associations what their experience have been uh, with the lockdown, with the uh, initiatives um, in in these conditions, and um, what actually worked for them. So, any questions, if anybody? Thanks, Dan. Did anybody have any questions? Um, Dan, will you be um, sharing with us, as you usually do when the contest is over, um, some of the submissions and the, the winners? Uh, absolutely. So um, that will be uh, in May uh, when we're going to have uh, the, the results of it. I guess we're going to uh, uh, definitely have to, to share the results. I think so far, uh, I think we have uh, about six of the uh, HCDSB schools that uh, are participants and we're looking forward for uh, more of them to, to be part of the uh, contest. Can you, uh, you know what, why don't we um, maybe, is Andrea Ricci on the call? I'm wondering um, if we can maybe send this out on our SEAC um, Twitter. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thinking that we can maybe try to see if we can get some more schools to participate. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And if there's something in particular, um, Dan, if you can just send me um, a link or something in particular um, that you'd like us to push out, I can send that. Um, definitely. So I think the poster and the link uh, underneath uh, with, for uh, rules and for registration, that, that will be the most um, I guess, brief uh, information that can be put in a quick uh, info. OK. Yep, will do. Thanks so much, Andrea. Yeah. Um, and Andrea Spenden said they'll be promoting the contest on the board website and through the board's social media channel as well. That would be great. Awesome. Thanks so much. Maria, you had a quick question? Well, I guess it's in line with um, <clears throat> the last few comments, is just wondering how this information is getting to uh, the schools and I'm just thinking about it's probably too late but Dan mentioned the deadline had been extended but something like council of chairs where you have all the principals and all the council chairs um, present as a way to um, to make more schools aware I'm not sure what happens right now so that's it was just a thought I had S Stephanie you had your hand up yeah, we sent a memo out to all of the schools in the system a week or two ago with all of the details so that they can participate. Awesome, thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Dan. We look forward to hearing the results of the contest. It's always a great initiative every year. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay, uh, Stephanie, you're up for superintendent's report. Great, thanks Brenda and thanks everybody for the feedback so far this evening. It's actually really timely as I put in my comment. Um, our team has been having some discussions with Andrea and her team as she is um, moving content to the new site and we're really going through some of that information to make it more easily accessible. So this is really good feedback for us as a group. Um, with respect to staff professional development and training, the enhanced autism training is the first thing I'd like to speak to. 
On January 10th, the Ontario government had announced additional funding to the Geneva Centre for Autism for a new training program. The objective of the program is to provide an enhanced learning experience. In addition to learning fundamental autism and applied behavior analysis skills and support techniques, the autism, uh, the enhanced autism training program takes it a step further by adding a live practice session. It's a one day live session and participants will be working through a series of activities that are designed to put their knowledge into practice. It does promote a hands on experience, practicing skills taught in the online course and participants will be able to transfer these skills into their school setting. We've already sent the information out uh, via our internal memos to all of our schools. Uh, to promote the training and the tra training is open to all educators, including our educational assistants who work with students and who have not participated in prior training. So we are looking forward to that participation. Uh, with respect to some of the other training that's taken place, our educational assistants, we um, are offering the more of the theoretical component of the safe management intervention training. And we are in the process of determining next steps for the more physical components and the in uh, the practical components in consultation with public health. So we're working on those plans. We are adding to our complement of safe management to train the trainers. We've uh, trained an additional itinerant EA, which brings our training team to eight. And we continue to actively recruit for educational assistance. And I do want to thank Andrea and Simone, our EA managers, who do a great job of recruiting and interviewing almost weekly. Our certs and our I certs um, have participated in quite a bit of PD and training since our last meeting in December. It's been a busy month of January. Some of the topics include the self match program, trauma training from our social work team, and sending IEPs electronically for term two. The I certs have also extended their ongoing learning um, opportunities to our virtual school. We really made an effort to support the teachers that are in the virtual school with um, strategies and supports to uh, help our online learners. With respect to SIA, um, we did want to share that we have distributed 313 SIA AT devices between October and December 31st. And we feel like we're in a really good position when it comes to uh, SIA equipment. With regards to parent and family engagement, um, we had a really small idea that grew quite quickly, I will say. Uh, we held two read and write interactive parent training sessions on the board YouTube channels where they can be found at this point. So Jen um, worked with our software provider for read and write and Jen Thompson is our consultant for SIA. And we uh, put the information out to our schools and parents were sent a, a follow up FAQ that they had the opportunity to participate in the presentation by asking questions. We had an overwhelming number of parents who registered. We had 335 parents to be exact, and that forced us to switch our um, format. We ended up going with a live stream teams and then we also made it available on the YouTube channel. So we are planning as a group um, for some future sessions and there was a feedback component um, with the FAQ and as a team we are, you know, I think that they gave us a lot of information with respect to the interest that's out there and Andrea and her team was great to support us. Um, so we are going to continue to consider how best to message and manage really large numbers of participants and how to make it open to um, parents who don't have students with special education needs should they be interested. Um, I spoke a little earlier about kindergarten registration. The um, information has gone out to schools about our kindergarten registration evening for students with special education needs, as well as the kindergarten information um, evening will occur on Wednesday, March 27th and, or 4th, sorry. And as I mentioned, it will be via Teams. It is the first time that we are doing it um, electronically. And I am really curious to see if we have greater participation in that. So it is planned from 7 to 830 and the information has been posted on each of the school websites. And I have made note of some of the conversation we had tonight uh, as we create our presentation for this year. 
to be mindful to include the SEAC information and to also uh, see if we can put a video together. At least a component of the presentation could have some uh, a video component. Um, with respect to mental health and well-being, it's Bell Let's Talk Week. Uh, resources have been shared across the system. Schools are doing a really great job of prom promoting the event as well as mental health tips in general. Mental health and well-being icon, as was mentioned in the earlier presentation, has been added to the new website landing page. We felt it was really important that you could quickly find that information. And thanks to Strategic Communications for helping us with that. Our CYCs and our social workers uh, continue to support students, staff and families with regards to students. They continue to deliver the tier one supports um, for our staff. They continue to offer resources to support student mental health and staff wellness and engagement. We have hired a new temporary itinerant uh, child and youth counselor to support our schools and offer more support in our buildings and virtually. Um, and also focus on some um, resources for our more specialized classes. Our social workers also continue to focus on supporting students and families. Multiple presentations have been provided to staff focusing on student mental health, wellness, and trauma sensitive classrooms. So I am grateful to those groups for all of the support that they lend to our schools, especially at this time. Our speech and language services are being provided virtually. There's no pause in that department for sure. We had 75 tier one speech and language social communication programs that have been delivered in classrooms by our CDAs to date. Our psych staff continue to process uh, psychological assessments and provide consultation to schools as well as completing direct testing in anticipation of the lockdown before Christmas. And since then, in consultation with public health, we've also revisited being able to go into schools for essential assessments. Our behavior analysts continue to provide their support to schools and in person where it's deemed essential. And both the behavior analysts and psych staff are preparing PD material for the ABA Bonanza. That leads me to the ABA Bonanza 2.0. We don't have a technical name for it, but that's where we are at, this, at the early stages right now. We have decided to proceed with planning and organizing an interdisciplinary committee has met and we're proceeding with the planning and organizing it um, for the board in the spring. So if there are any questions, I know that was a lot of information. I did try to condense it for the sake of time. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Deborah, you got your hand up? Sorry. Yeah, I did just have a question. I recognize the time. So um, it was, I'm sorry, Stephanie. I may have missed it at the beginning. The first point you talked about the autism um, training and uh, professional development uh, available to all staff. Yes. Uh, may, maybe I missed it. Uh, who is running this, this training? It's through the Geneva Center for Autism. Okay. So what we do, we get uh, spots that our staff can sign up for. Okay. And uh, I'm just curious, how many uh, how many spots do you, um, do you have? I think we have about 10. So it's based on the funding that we're provided. And uh, we have had spaces available in the past. It's a similar uh, content. The difference is that they've added the one day of live. And we've right. had a lot of our staff participate in past uh, opportunities. That's great. In terms of the content, is it, is it kind of widespread or does it focus more on behavior therapy? Or does it include, or I'm, I'm not sure if you even have that information. I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't have that specific information. I know Jody's on the call. I don't know if she has more information, but I haven't been provided that information at this point. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, is there any other questions? No? Okay. Uh, okay, thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, we next we have the trustee. We're almost at the end, guys. <laughs> next, we have our trustee um, report. Uh, so, Trustee Guzzo, are you able to provide? Yes, I'm here. It's not a long one, so it's uh, so I shouldn't be too long. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so, just an update on what's been happening at the board table. 
Um, our director's annual report that um, was presented at our last board meeting. It's actually, it's up on our wonderful new website. Um, thank you again to uh, Andrew and Rob for all their work in getting that done. Um, some important things to note, there was a change to our uniform policy, II-40. Um, and I know you all heard a lot about it because it was a work in progress for a, a good eight months. Um, the simple change is, is that um, it allows for those families that are online, virtual, to be able to, uh, to cast a, a vote in whether or not they want policies, I mean, uniforms in their school. Uh, online and it's prescribed on how that will happen and who it's with. Um, we are about to enter, we're about to finish up our five-year strategic plan, which means we're entering into our next strategic planning process. Um, it was reported uh, again on the last board meeting, so we will be commencing that shortly. Um, the Learn at Home, as we know, it has been extended uh, until a time that has not been defined. Um, Director Daly provides updates um, at every board meeting. And uh, again, all of our updates are either tweeted or posted on our website. Um, extended French immersion, or early French immersion, sorry. Um, there was a motion put on the table back in December to extend, extend the program or expand the program. Um, the last board meeting, there was report that in Burlington and Halton Hills, that the current locations will allow for expansion. However, in Oakville and in Milton, um, that wasn't uh, the case. So the current locations of the programs uh, would not be able to, to meet the demand for expansion. So two new locations have been given. Uh, in Oakville, St. Mar Marguerite Deweyville has been uh, uh, has been named the uh, the new location for the, uh, the e expansion of the program. And in Melton, and this is only a temporary site, it's St. Peter's, um, it will be for one year and that has to go under a boundary review, which means that regular track and the program could potentially have some changes to them. Um, and other than that, at this point, that is the update. And thank you very much for all you do and happy new year and welcome back everybody. Thanks so much, Nancy, I appreciate it. Um, Okay, um, next SEAC discussion. I don't have anything down there for a SEAC discussion. Um, we've discussed a lot tonight. <laughs> so uh, if anybody has anything for SEAC discussion, let me know. And if not, I will move on. Sorry, Brenda, I have one real quick one if I can. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, I, we heard at CPIC that there's some program money available this year and that typically goes to school councils. I'm just wondering, I think CX are eligible for program money too. I don't know how it works if you have to apply beforehand, but I know last year we talked about having some speakers come in and obviously that all didn't happen because of COVID and so on. But I'm just wondering, um, you know, and I, there's not much time to spend the money on wondering if some schools aren't some, I guess the money's being allocated by families of schools. Are they all going to be able to use all the money that's available? Could there be some money for SEAC? I just want to throw that out there. Um, and I didn't see anywhere else on the agenda where it fits. So um, that's all I had there. Maybe for some further discussion offline. Okay. Um, Stephanie or Pat, do you want to take a crack at that? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can give a response right now, but I can certainly check with Nancy. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the uh, the timelines are around that family of school submission. I know um, Ms. Lorenko is at CPEC, but I I can't recall the the process right off the top of my head. But I can follow up and let you know. That'd be great. Thank you. Good. Answer. I can share quickly what I what I do know. Um, we were told at CPIC that it was going to be $10,000 per family of schools. And I did follow up with Superintendent Denolfo because I wasn't sure how that was the plan was to, to spread that out um, and what the timeline was. So she said the money had to be spent by June 30th. So that's all I know. And I'm, I'm sure you can maybe find out more. I think she was also um, said she was inquiring with the business services department. So it seems like they might be the keepers of the details. So for what that's worth. Okay. Yeah. So, if, so Pat, if you or Stephanie want to get back and give us some information on that, that would be great. And we can share that with uh, with the group. 
Thank you so much. Uh, okay, um, so meeting summary and next steps. We've identified some things that on our on our plan that we need to bring back for next meeting. A um, couple of subcommittee um, conversations. Um, so uh, I don't think we have a whole lot there. I think we've talked a lot about um, some next steps throughout the meeting tonight. Our next agenda is, for our next meeting is Monday, February the 22nd. The agenda will include special education plan review discussion, policy II-29 inclusion and range of placement options for identified students, um, as well as um, some of the things we've discussed tonight that we've agreed to bring back to the meeting for next meeting. Um, Okay, for uh, re um, absenteeism, um, be it resolved that Marvin Dort has been excused. Can I get a mover? Uh, Nancy moving it, can I get a second? I'll second it. Mar Thanks Maria. Maria, appreciate that. Okay, the, the next one, motion to adjourn. Can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll move that, Brenda. Thanks, Maria. Can I get a second? Nancy, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, thank you. So if you'll join me in the sign of our faith for our closing prayer, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, blessed are you, O God of all creation. Each day you spread before us the rich and wonderful diversity of the human family created in the divine splendor of your love. Fashioned in your image, you call us to love one another with the same tender care with which you brought us to creation. Each of us is but one small part of the glory that is you. As we serve the students and families of the Halton Catholic District School Board on the Special Education Advisory Committee, fill us with your grace, guide us with your wisdom, and give us the strength and courage to do your work so that it may always be said of our every act, God saw that it was good. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, everybody. I know this was a long one. Uh, I appreciate your time. I think we do some great work here and I look forward to our next meeting. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Brenda and Maria.